This seminar is going to be a fundamental course on cosmic gamesmanship. We shall discuss um, first of all the yang and the yin because what we are studying is the way whatever may be called the universal energy plays. And so the fundamental thing is yang and yin, the positive and negative principles, to use the Chinese words. Next we shall discuss relativity. Next we shall discuss uh, group theory, in and out. And finally, we shall discuss identity. Who are you? But in starting, the moment one talks about cosmic gamesmanship, it carries with it the assumption that the physical universe is a game. And that doesn't seem to be taking it sufficiently seriously. Of course, according to Hindu philosophy, the physical universe is an illusion. They use the word maya. But maya has many meanings, and uh, among these meanings, only one is illusion. And the word illusion, of course, always carries a bad connotation to Western ears. We want something that's for real. But it doesn't necessarily carry such a bad connotation to Hindu ears, because the word maya also means magic, creative power, art, and, of all things, measurement, because it comes from the Sanskrit root matra, M-A-T-R, from which, of course, we get meter, matter, and the Latin mater, mother. In other words, uh, the world is looked upon, or can be looked upon, as a perfectly good illusion, because all art, in a way, is the creation of illusion. On a stage, the actor plays, and Hindus think of the world by analogy with drama. The whole thing is a big act, and there is one actor behind the whole thing, which is you. Not you in the sense of your so-called empirical ego, not you as you imagine yourself and as you ordinarily sense yourself to be, but what is really and truly you at a much deeper level. But you see, when we use the word game or play in English, we usually tend to mean that it's something trivial. You see, we divide life very strictly into play and work. Other peoples don't do this. And that's... Uh, one of the shatteringly awful features of our culture, this division of play and work, so that most people are working at tasks which they hate so that they can make enough money to stop doing it and play. Now, this is perfectly ridiculous. Nobody needs to do that. Because what you get with work, done in this way, done heartlessly and without joy, is money. And what can you do with it? Supposing you do earn time to spare and money to spend, what is there to buy with it? The answer is the other fake and joyless products made by other people who hate their work. <laughs> so there is a certain phoniness, a certain lack of essential quality in uh, almost all the work that we perform because the work is done not for the work but for money and play is considered something separate from work. Work is serious. Play is not serious. In fact, uh, we have a strange incapacity to play at all. Because we always, especially in the United States, play with an ulterior motive. That is to say, play is good for you. And we do everything because it's good for us, because we judge the physical world with, um, without our senses, 
We judge in theory. We believe that the proof of the pudding is not in the eating, but in the chemical analysis. It is often my fate to have to take lunch in college cafeterias. And uh, what must be happening to the intellectual life of the nation as a result of professors, graduate students, and students eating this kind of stuff this must be catastrophic. Because I go all over the United States to various colleges, and everywhere the fare is exactly the same. You get a so-called salad, which is a piece of that wretched icebox lettuce, with a dollop of cottage cheese and a wedge of canned pineapple on top of it. And then you get slices of beef that have been tormented for hours in an electronic purgatory, <laughs> sloshed over, or rather coated is the exact word, with a gravy made of water, library paste, and bouillon cubes. <laughs> Then there are very uh, there are peas, carrots, and corn, which have been sterilized, because that's important, by boiling for hours. And finally, there is a pie, which is a slab of beige goo, <laughs> crusted in reconstituted cardboard, and topped with sweetened shaving cream squirted from an aerosol bomb. <laughs> and all this has been analyzed by dietitians and uh, by the whole department of home economics, and is found to veritably contain the right amount of calories, proteins, carbohydrates, and vitamins. Now, actually, this is all a result of academic politics, because academic politics, you know, is mainly concerned with feuding between departments. And this is the way in which the home economics department has won out by rotting the brains of historians, anthropologists, mathematicians, and physicists with this miserable fare. <laughs> And uh, this goes on all over. Things are judged, you see, because they are good for you. And if we inquire carefully as to what this good for us is, uh, you, you know, you mustn't look into that. It's taboo. Uh, the whole culture would fall apart if we found out what it was, because what is the good that is good for you is always and necessarily something in the future. It never happens and is never going to happen. All that these vitamins and carbohydrates and things can do for you is keep you in a state of reasonable survival and uh, uh, in which you, you never catch up with anything. Because you see, time is strictly an illusion. There is no such thing as time any more than there is such a concrete thing as the equator. The measurement of time, time is a measure of motion, just like lines of latitude and longitude are a measure of the geographic surface of the Earth. And nobody will ever tie up a rolled roast with the equator. Uh, there is, however, such a thing as timing, which is quite different from time. Timing is skillful rhythm. And, but you cannot ever attain proper timing if you hurry, if you're in a hurry to get to the future, because the future is never going to arrive. So if you hurry to get to the future, you always get a punishment for it. For example, instant coffee, <laughs> TV dinners, the sort of food they serve on airplanes, or, or beef that is cooked in electronic ovens where you push the switch and, and a whole roast is done. It isn't, it's heated through, it's not roasted. And all these things are awful because they are the result of the illusion of time. That there is something that is good for us and that we're going to get to. And so uh, this is the result of an educational system which is completely geared to literary and mathematical pursuits which trains everybody to be clerks, sales, uh, insurance salesmen and bureaucrats. And only with great reluctance does education offer any kind of instruction in material competence and then only for people who are considered too stupid uh, to be intellectuals, to go on to college. So the basic arts of life in our culture, farming, cooking, dressing, furnishing, lovemaking, are utterly neglected. There is no sophisticated training widely available in any of these things for the average person. And so that, that's the reason why there is nothing on which to spend the time that we save and the money we earn, except trash.
So uh, fake cars, pasteboard houses, bread made of squishy styrofoam, vitamin enriched, and uh, all that sort of thing, see, because of the illusion. Uh, we've fallen for the illusion of time. So only uh, uh, the, 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 what is absolutely necessary for a culture, that means a society of cultivated people, is the cultivation and devotion to the present, to the material world, rather than to the purely theoretical world. You see, Maya in Sanskrit uh, does indicate in one sense the physical world, because uh, in the positive sense that the physical world is actually a marvelous work of art. But Maya, in another sense, in the sense in which it means measurement, refers to all the ways we have of numbering and naming and dividing up into categories the physical world. So time is Maya. Latitude and longitude is Maya. The future is Maya. In the, the, the less... Uh, exciting sense of illusion. So, you see, because of this state of mind, we, we don't uh, think that play is important. We play in order to refresh ourselves to go back to work. And that's not playing. Playing is uh, a real absorption in, a, in the delight of a dance, for example. You don't dance because it's good for you, you dance because you're happy. But you see, we have a very odd incapacity for happiness because we are happier when we expect good things to happen rather than when they're happening. And so we say of a thing that we consider bad, <clears throat> it has no future. Well, nothing has a future. There isn't a future. There's always a present, and one has to get this as a kind of a basic approach. So then, one can also, therefore, use the word play or game in a sense that is not trivial. We don't think, for example, that when we hear a performance of a Bach cantata, or better, a purely uh, non-symbolic thing, like a fugue, uh, we don't think that that's trivial. We don't think it's trivial to play the organ in church. Uh, we don't think that the plays of Shakespeare are trivial. They're plays. A play, you see, in the sense that I'm using it, is a musical thing. It is a dance. It is an expression of delight in the sense of Blake saying that energy is eternal delight. And, uh, for example, the art of Islam, the arabesques, which aren't pictures of anything. They're just fantastically intricate, beautifully colorful designs. They are play. And according to this thesis, the universe is just like that. It is a very, very elaborate play system. And the fundamental elements of this play, the Chinese call the yang and the yin, Yang means uh, the positive and yin the negative. Yang refers to the south side of a mountain, which is in the sun, and yin to the north side, which is in the shade. Yang refers to the north bank of a river, which is in the sun, and yin to the south bank of a river, which is in the shade. Yang is symbolically or prototypically male. Yin is symbolically female. That's not to cast any reflections on women. Uh, but, uh, so you might say, this, the reason they're called male and female is that yang is aggressive and yin is yielding. Uh, yang is convex, yin is concave. Now, the secret about the opposites which is as important as realizing that there is no such thing as time. The secret about the opposites is this, that they appear to be as different as different can be. We say of opposites, like black and white, 
that the, they are the poles apart. But in using that phrase, poles, you imply a connection between them. As there is a connection of the north to the south pole of the earth, and as there is a connection between the north and south poles of a magnet. They are two ends of the same stick, two sides of the same coin, two opposite points on the same sphere. And that means that they go together. In Chinese, this is called arising mutually, as in the second chapter of Lao Tzu, where he says, when all the world knows beauty to be beautiful, there is already ugliness. When all the world knows goodness to be good, there is already evil. For to be and not to be arise mutually. What confuses people is that they don't see this. They think, for example, that the positive is something there which truly exists whereas the negative has less reality. It doesn't exist. We think that, for example, the space in which this universe floats is a non-entity and has no importance. And we are thereby, because we see energy manifested in the positive aspect of things, and no energy manifested in the negative, we are afraid that energy and its delight is threatened by nothingness. That it's going to be swallowed up and that in the end darkness will win. We feel that about ourselves and we feel it about the universe as a whole. Because energy is effort. And effort, after a while you get tired and you can't keep it up. And so darkness must win. <clears throat> according to Chinese philosophy that is a hallucination because energy cannot be manifested without inertia there must be something to push against for there to be any manifestation of energy you cannot dance without a floor to use your energy against you cannot, when energy or any kind of motion is completely unobstructed, there's a sort of squish, a fizzle, and nothing happens. Because fundamentally, as we shall see next hour, motion is only realized when there is stillness, relative stillness. And so energy is only realized when there is inertia and the positive is only realized when there is the negative to bring it out. These things work together, but when you don't realize it, you are anxious. You are afraid that the dark side is going to win. Now, the minute that happens, you become unable to play. You start getting serious and the game degenerates into a fight. Because you feel it absolutely urgent and necessary under those circumstances that the positive must be made to win. Accentuate the positive, you see. And that leads to all this beastly kind of religion where people go around with four smiles and hearty handshakes and uh, uh, accentuate the positive. And the moment that a person does that, you know that it's a big fake, it's a put-on, and that there's something utterly unreal about it. That's why you may have often experienced the fact that certain kinds of virtuous people are offensively virtuous, <laughs> and they are very difficult to get on with. They don't have any light touch. <coughs> and, of course, this is particularly prevalent in religions. Because... Uh, not all religions, but many religions are states of terror about the negative side. 
I was talking with a very enlightened nun the other day, Catholic, and she was open to all sorts of new ideas. I said, you know, uh, there's one thing wrong with your worship and the way you sing your hymns and chant your chants and uh, do all these rituals. You don't swing. I mean, I don't mean by that that it isn't syncopated. I mean by that that there is not an attitude of delight about it. It's always you feel the service is being conducted in the presence of the chief inspector of morals. <laughs> the, uh, the, the original stuffed shirt. The appalling grandfather in whose presence you don't uh, show any kind of sprightliness. Because after all, you know, when we are children and we are very exuberant and we leap around and bounce and all over the place, we make the adults tired. Because the moment a child starts getting exuberant, is, they, we try to give him a guilty conscience. You have no business having so much fun. There are other people in the world who hurt. There are people who are starving. There are people who suffer. And for you to go around leaping around as if the whole thing were gorgeous is a kind of irreverence. So be guilty. Shut up. So as a result of that, where we think that an occasion is of particular solemnity, where you're in church or in court or uh, standing in a row of uh, marines or something saluting the flag, uh, everybody gets grim. And so there is no delight in religion of that kind. Well, this nun agreed with me that uh, they, they really ought to do something about that. And I said, well, maybe I'll come to your convent and teach you how to sing. <laughs> but you see, all of that is because uh, of the fear that the nothing will win over the something. Now, it's true, in games, there is a winner and there is a loser. But in a fight, it's different. In a fight, the object of victory is to get rid of the defeated party. Because he's bad, and he ought not to be there at all. But in a game, it's quite different. Because... If there is to be a winner, there has to be a loser. So it's terribly important not to get rid of the opponent. You could have no chess unless you had the black side as well as the white. Impossible. So in a game, uh, what we, we admire, a person we call a good loser. That is to say, a good sport. Because he does not take the loss seriously. It's very instructive, for example, to play any game that you know well, whether it's chess or checkers or whatever, with yourself. And each time you move over to the opposite side, uh, play it with your best skill. For example, you can play a very marvelous game. You take two cocktail um, olive uh, toothpicks, you know, the kind they, they make into little plastic swords. And you do a fencing match with yourself. And actually try to stick one of your hands, and the other hand really tries to defend itself. You find this is extremely interesting. It's a meditation exercise. And, uh, and then you realize, you see, uh, what is the nature of a game. Because if you are a good chess player, uh, you may congratulate yourself if your opponent wins, if you have given him a good contest. Because then the game as such was interesting. And you come to realize that you and your opponent in a game of chess together constitute a single organism, like your right hand and your left hand fencing with each other. 
Let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. That means have a conspiracy to pretend that they don't belong to one organism and that they're different, like black and white, like space and solid. They must look as different as possible. But underneath, in order that there be a game, in order that there be, in other words, a relationship of these two, there has to be a secret agreement. They have to be tacitly one, but uh, openly two. Exoterically two, esoterically one. Because, you see, on the stage... When you get the hero and the villain, they are really friends behind the scenes because they belong to the same company of actors. But this mustn't be admitted on the stage because that would give the show away. Now you see, it's true, we mustn't give the show away. That's why there are esoteric teachings. But on the other hand, there is another opposite extreme uh, which is not realizing that the show is a show. And that's as bad as giving the show away. So you have always, when you are in the theater, say you go to the movies, and you go to see some <clears throat> great horror movie, you know, awful thing. Well, why does one do it? You want a thrill. And the whole of the universe wants a thrill. That's what it's all about. Otherwise it would be boring. But when you go to the movie, you know in your heart of hearts that it's only a movie. And yet you contrive to some degree to forget this while you're there. And therefore get scared and uh, feel real creeps. But that's great. Some people like to go and cry. They go and see some tragedy. And just love to weep, because it's a catharsis. It uh, gets all the salt out of you or something, I don't know. And uh, uh, so uh, you, 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 you do this thing. And uh, it is, we can say it's vicarious. Yeah. But that is the spirit of showmanship, of play. So one might say then that uh, it is possible in this life to attain a sort of metaphysical courage. in which you are, you know, really know deep within that the most harrowing experiences that physical existence can offer are a show. Now this is the, uh, what you might call, ultimate nerve. And, for example, when the samurai in Japan studied Zen, that's what they wanted to get from it. They wanted to get ultimate nerve so that absolutely nothing would faze them. So there is a poem which says, under the sword lifted high, there is hell making you tremble. But go ahead, and there is the land of bliss. Don't hesitate, see? Don't, don't be blocked. Don't be um, phased, nonplussed by the illusion. Now you would say, well, that's all very well, but I can't bring myself to that. I start to shake and I can't stop it. It's not to do with my will. And no amount of gritting my teeth, clenching my muscles, uh, exercising my willpower can get rid of the shakes when I am really scared. That's true. But you must remember that the secret to all this is not to be afraid of fear. When you can really allow yourself to be afraid and you don't resist the experience of fear, you are truly beginning to master fear. But when you refuse to be afraid, you are resisting fear. And that simply sets up a vicious circle of being afraid of fear and being afraid of being afraid of fear and so on. And that's what we call worry. Worry is simply a chronic 
condition. And people who worry are going to worry no matter what happens. Because when one possible threat is exterminated, they will immediately discover another. Because worry is an infinitely skinned onion. And you can go on and on and on because the moment you see, you reduce the size of the onion and you get your worry down to about this, suddenly your whole sense of distance and size changes. And because you're looking so intently at this little onion, it fills your whole field of vision and is once again a big onion. See? You start peeling that down. But as you get another little one about this size, then it enlarges itself in your judgment and your sense of values. And it, once more it's colossal. Now that's always going on. So if you are disposed to worry, there is always plenty to worry about. You make plenty of money and you have no troubles about that, then you start wondering if you're going to get a disease. And the doctor says, no, it's all right, you, you, nothing wrong with you. Then you wonder if you're going to get into an accident. And then you take precautions and then you wonder if there's going to be a political revolution, um, etc whether your house is going to be robbed. Uh, there's always something. So it is a, really, this kind of worrying is a completely useless pursuit. And yet, we feel a little guilty if we don't do it. Because uh, it's somehow put into us that a proper amount of worrying is uh, showing a good sense of responsibility. You're concerned. And Paul Tillich, uh, use this word concern in a special way. And Quakers always use the word concern. And all people, you might say, who are socially conscious are concerned. So when we say, I am concerned, it means I have a frown on my face. And uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about you, about the nation, about the war, and so on. Concerned. And Tillich said... Religion is ultimate concern. I am concerned about the universe. And he used this wonderful decontaminated word for, for God, which he got from Eckhart, the ground of being. See, God still has whiskers on it, but the ground of being doesn't, obviously. And so uh, t t ultimate concern is to be concerned about the ground of being. Well, now, I don't think... You, you, well, I'm not sure about Tillis. I, I knew him, and he was a very wonderful man. But what I call concern, in the, the way I would want to interpret it, instead of this sort of frown, is something more like amazement. In other words, that existence... <coughs> is extremely peculiar. Um, I mean, it's... I can't get my... I can't explain this feeling because I don't know quite how to ask a question about existence so that I could be said to be wondering about it in some sort of clear-thinking way. What... what uh, it's a very nice thing to consider to yourself that if you were going to have an interview with the Lord God and you would have only five minutes, and you might ask one question, what would you ask? And you've got plenty of time to think this over in advance. <laughs> and you realize, question after question, you say, no, that's not really the thing I want to get at. Uh-uh, it's not that. Like, do you exist? God would say, well, of course, yes, here I am. <laughs> Am I having a hallucination? <laughs> no. Well, uh, I'm, how can I be sure that this isn't a hallucination, you see? And then you reject all that sort of question. And when you finally come down to it, you don't know what to ask. There is a sort of question in your mind, not so much a question as a questioning. A feeling of, it's all unbelievable. It's amazing. I wonder at it. I marvel at it. It is a miracle that there is anything. But um, 
It's like a friend of mine who went to a Zen master, got an interview after a good deal of trouble, an interpreter. And he sat down and said, you know, now I'm here, I don't know what to ask. I just feel like laughing. And Zen master said, well, let's laugh. <laughs> and they just broke up. So... <laughs> But that feeling, you see, of the, the marvelousness of being is what I call, or would want to mean by Tuick's phrase, ultimate concern. It's also love is involved in it. See, that's the part of the problem of um, an abstractionist culture such as ours. As I indicated, we are not materialists, we are abstractionists. Uh, a materialist is a, is a lover, and therefore is somebody related to the present. Because, you see, you, you can't love except in the present. When you have under your hands a piece of wood, and uh, you say, my, hasn't that a gorgeous grain? You know, and you fondle it. If it moves, fondle it. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you run over this and think, hey, it's not gorgeous, you see. Well, you're, so you're loving it. Uh, it may be that it's an apple in your hand, and you say, I love you so much I could eat you. And you eat it. And you relish it. That's loving in a special way. So, uh, concern and love, and there are many forms of love, there's a whole spectrum of different kinds of love, which runs from the red of libido to the violet of divine charity. But all of them are equally important, because, as you know, you can't have the violet end without the red end, and vice versa. You wouldn't know what violet was, unless you had all the other colours. The colors create each other. So it isn't simply black and white. Between black and white is the spectrum. And just as black and white arise mutually, so you know red in relation to yellow, in relation to green, in relation to blue, and so on. But they all come out of black and white. That's the secret. I think Mr. Land, who invented a camera, made a rather spectacular demonstration of this. So, if then you try to obliterate fear, the fear that black may win. You are working in the wrong way. To attack a fear is to strengthen it. Because immediately you feel guilty if you don't succeed. Or you feel inadequate. But fear is something that arises naturally and spontaneously under certain circumstances just as you will feel warm if you get near a fire. And uh, you can't go up to a fire without some sort of self-hypnosis and then say, well, I refuse to be warm. There's something a bit weird about that. Besides, you often want to feel warm when you get near a fire. No, on the contrary, it is very natural to be afraid. And so if you don't try to knock it down, you don't try to make yourself over into some sort of preconceived idea of what you ought to be, then you're on the track. Now, when you think, for example, that I ought to change myself into something different, but what is the agency which will affect this change? Well, we could say two things. 
on the one hand, it's the same self that you want to change. So how can it change it? Or on the other hand, you can say that the idea that there is a sort of separate ego in you which can go to work on the rest of you is a hallucination. And that's why gurus and teachers set their students weird tasks they may discover that the dissociated ego is indeed a hallucination. Now, for example, one of the ones that is commonly used is to get yourself a pure mind. And that means you control your thoughts and emotions. You mustn't have any violent or hateful emotions. You mustn't hate anybody. You mustn't have any sexy emotions. All pure ideas. Clean up. You know what happens. So, so many... Uh, in the parent-child relationship, uh, many parents can't stand their children. Uh, they're a nuisance. They're the result of bad rubber goods. And uh, they didn't mean to have them anyway. And they're expensive and noisy. And they've disturbed the peace of the place... And they, they detest them. But you cannot admit in this culture that you detest your child. That's the most awful thing. But you see, what happens if you don't admit it is that whereas outwardly you go through the motions of being loving and dutiful, you don't smell right, and the child gets it. The child knows intuitively and inwardly that there's a crossed-up message here. It says love, but it acts hate. Vice versa. A lot of children hate their mothers, hate their fathers. That's supposed to be very bad. And the uh, whole pandemonium that's going on these days is uh, largely due to that, that nobody can come out and be honest about it. So now control your thoughts. Watch that hate. The moment it arises, doing. <laughs> Knock it down. Well, now you know the guru who's teaching you all this. Uh, you've projected quite a bit on him. Uh, the fact that you accepted a guru at all shows that um, you have endowed another person with much greater wisdom than yourself. That's your opinion, incidentally. <laughs> and therefore, people invariably attribute to gurus all kinds of astounding powers, especially of a telepathic nature. And indeed... Uh, a good guru is a very sensitive fellow and can tell by people's eyes and gestures and tone of voice all sorts of things about them, as can any experienced psychologist. But you see, when you are trying to control your thoughts and you know you have some kind of wrong thought, you project upon the guru to recognize it instantly. He reads you. He sees right through you. And therefore you know that he almost must look at you as a terrible worm. Because you can never quite succeed in doing it, you see. And the lesson of this is, you see, the whole point of this lesson, is to discover that the alleged you, which is different from your thoughts and feelings, is a hallucination. There is a stream of thought and feeling going on, just like there is a stream of water going by, and that's you. It's an organized stream, just in the same way that when you see a whirlpool in a river, it's organized, it's recognizable, it has a shape. And it has an enduring shape, even though it is a constant flow. Or take a better illustration still, a, a flame on a candle. It is a stream of gas. 
and no particle of this gas stays in the flame for but a split second. But the flame keeps apparently there and is recognizable. I can say, one, two, three flames, this one, that one, the other one. And that's like us. But that stream, which we are, is thought, feeling, uh, what we call the body, uh, everything like that. But the body is one of the most intangible things there is. You seem to be able to grab hold of it. But it is nothing more than a vibrating pattern of energy. And on it flows. So when you understand that, uh, you can see a little bit more why Hindus speak of the body as maya, as illusion. Because one of the things they mean by illusion is transitoriness as distinct from permanence. That is to say, everything in this world is <coughs> disintegrating. <coughs> in fact, if it weren't, it wouldn't be there. Disintegration is life. And it's as important to see that as it is to see that there is no time and that black and white go together. Because it, to the extent that you see it is disintegrating and that there's no way of stopping this, you can get into a frame of mind where you get with it. Where you, as it were, give up and fall apart along with everything else. <laughs> now, you might think, you see, again, our, in our general Western frame of mind, we would think, well, that's just giving up. That's spineless. That's cowardice. That's, uh, that's awful. And anybody who would just give up like that would be expected to become a slob. <laughs> But the contrary is true. You see, in all what you might call the dynamics of the spiritual life, there are what appear to be many paradoxes. Courses of action which in common sense would lead to one result turn out, in fact, to lead to an opposite result. So you would think that a child who admits to hatred of parents, or vice versa, would act out the hatred, would do something violent. No, it is precisely the one who does not admit it that will act out and who will do something violent. Because like the monk of Siberia, who are fasting grew wearier and wearier, the violence will at last burst from itself. It can't be contained. And I found again and again and again in going around, especially in religious circles, where so many people are trying to not admit what they feel. Especially Puritans, prudes, very frequently have a strong streak of cruelty. And this, of course, can be a kind of a sexual substitute, a sadistic uh, or masochistic thing. Uh, that is simply because they, do, they don't ad admit to having a negative side. And so the negative side will express itself in a violent way. Uh, people who are always doing things for other people's good uh, will be liable to, to bomb them for their benefit. Uh, and utterly destroy them in the name of goodness. And uh, this is because uh, such people are not e ever going to be good soldiers. I was uh, talking a few, day, uh, a few weeks ago to the Air Force Weapons Research Lab at Kirtland, uh, near Albuquerque. And uh, I was somewhat surprised to be invited to this sinister institution. <laughs> but uh, it was full of extremely brilliant people. Uh, fantastic minds. And so naturally we got onto the subject of strategy. 
because uh, military strategy is a very, very interesting thing. It contains all the basic life problems. And I said to them when I started out, I said, now, you have asked me to tell you as a philosopher, what are my basic premises for moral behavior? Well, I said they are total selfishness. I'm not going to beat around the bush with you people. I'm going to be sentimental or anything like that because uh, you're dealing with uh, military matters mm -hmm. uh, where you have to be tough and where you have to uh, be so tough that you've no time for finer feelings. So let's begin that way. Now, I said you might imagine, therefore, that if I based my behavior on total selfishness, that I would go around being rude to people and aggressive and uh, pushing through and so on. But I said, I don't because I found it doesn't work. People put up resistance, they get uh, obstreperous, and I don't win them over. So my self-interest is better conserved by putting on a pretense of politeness and that I really am concerned about you all and so on. But I said, I am not. Uh, this is just a big act. Now, then I said, the next thing that happens is this. When I decide that I'm going to base everything on total selfishness, I start wondering what I want. Well, so many things that I thought I want, when I got them, I found out I didn't. So I have to go very deeply into the question, what do I really want? What sort of friends do I want? What sort of a house do I want? What sort of a life do I want? What sort of a job do I want to do? And you see, people don't think this through. They get all sorts of ready-made ideas of what they ought to want. Because what education does to us to so large an extent is to fit us into a set of prepared stereotypes. And we never stop to find out what we really want to do. Well, that's one thing. But then something else very odd comes up when I say I'm purely selfish, which is, what is me? And then I come across this curious thing, that I don't know who I am unless I know who you are. If I would live without any other people, I don't think I would know I was there. I see myself in terms of others. That is to say, by a social relationship. I am I because you are you. You are you because I am I. But then, uh, something, something that's gone screwy here, something funny about this. Which is, of course, that myself isn't at all what I thought it was. Myself is... Oop, almost everything else as well as myself. Well, then I really don't know what to do, because... Um, there's no point in my thinking anymore that I can just go around attacking people and uh, getting rid of them and so on. And uh, 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 Because all I'm doing is a sort of, um, as if I was hungry and I started chewing on my own toes. Because I discovered that hurting others hurts me. Now, of course, you do have to cut your toenails and take care of your hair and things like that. And uh, there's always uh, some kind of violence is necessary in life, just like you have to kill a fish to eat it, or you have to kill an apple when you chew it. Well, it's sort of like cutting off the toenails and combing your hair and so on, clipping and things like that. And so sort of like getting rid of dead skin and the general elimination process. But fundamentally, you see, when you think that there are dreadfully wrong people who ought to be obliterated, or that the world outside you is something that you are in a fight with. Well, that's just like um, a person who uh, is completely insensitive in the middle, so that he doesn't know that his legs, leg end goes with the top end. Um, you know that in worms, uh, if a worm gets damaged, it develops a sort of calloused area in it. 
and uh, the, the worm, when it wiggles, the rhythm of the wiggle doesn't pass through the calloused area. It has to wiggle separately on each end. So the worm, instead of going wiggle, 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 goes wiggle, bump, wiggle, bump, wiggle, bump, wiggle. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, uh, a lot of people are like that physically. This is one of the important things that Wilhelm Reich found out, that uh, people tend to have a state of tension in the diaphragm as a result of which they can't swing. Uh, you know, uh, have you ever tried to teach anybody to dance the hula? Lots of people just cannot bring themselves to make that hip motion. They're too rigid. And they're like the worm with the callus in them. Or then there's another myth about this. You know, there's a famous snake called Ouroboros. And he's always drawn chewing his own tail and eating it. Imagine what happens when the tail gets inside and it gets inside and inside. And the whole thing is clutched up, you see. Uh, and this worm, is a, this snake, is a symbol of what the Buddhists call samsara. That is to say, the round or rat race of life and death. And this goes on so long as the worm doesn't know that his tail is himself. When he discovers that, uh, he lets go of it and wiggles happily along uh, like a, every good snake should. <laughs> uh, of course, there is something more to it than that. You might say, well, why in the first place did he not realize that his tail was his own? Well, because he wanted something else. See, there wasn't anything except the snake in the beginning, because the snake is the symbol of God. But uh, in the Upanishads, in the Isha Upanishad, the first line of it said that in the beginning there was the one uh, God, the Ishvara. And he said, I'm lonely. And so he made another, which was a woman. And he made love to her. As a result of which all gods were born. But the woman got guilty about this because she felt it was incest. And so she turned herself into a cow. And he became a bull. And he made love to her. And so came all cattle. And the same thing happened. She got guilty and turned herself into a sheep. And he turned himself into a ram. And so on. And by this means the universe was created. So uh, this is othering. It's called in Christian theology by the Greek word kenosis, which means self-emptying. Uh, where God others himself in the sense of getting himself into a position where he forgets he's God. Or where he has abrogated omnipotence. Now, in the theory of games, it is absolutely important to abrogate omnipotence. Because you realize that if you knew, if your knowledge and power was without limit, there were no obstacle to it whatsoever, there would be no way of realizing it. When we know for certain the outcome of a game, we don't play it. We call it off. And we invent a new game in which we don't know the outcome. So power, whether partial power or omnipower, will always be in a state of abrogating itself. So the fundamental game, therefore, the fundamental game form, which is manifested in the yang and the yin, the two opposites, is, of course, the game of hide-and-seek. <coughs> of remembering and forgetting. You see, uh, really, to forget is the opposite of remember. Only the word hasn't the same form. We should put remember opposite dismember. Because... To remember is to put back the members of something that has been dismembered. So when the snake thinks that its tail isn't itself, it is dismembered. When the snake finds that its tail is itself, it's remembered. So that's why uh, the Catholics say uh, the words of Jesus at the Mass, do this in remembrance of me. 
so that you will discover that you are one body, which is, of course, the only body there is. So lesson number two is relativity. Lesson number one having been the opposites. In this course on cosmologic or cosmic gamesmanship, we were discussing the fact this morning that any manifestation of energy needs an opposition. In other words, nothing happens, there is no motion, there is no possibility of energy, unless there is something opposing it. There is no dancing except on a floor against which you can push and move. And so uh, I pointed out, therefore the sense of self depends entirely on the sensation of there being something other but that this is a kind of a maya. The, in other words, the general feeling that one side is definitively split off from and separate from the other is an illusion. But nevertheless, uh, there is the, 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 the opposition between energy and inertia, motion and stillness, is something that, um, as it were, is the bifurcation or two aspects of a single process. And the, you know it's a single process because they can't do without each other. If they could do without each other, then it would be a divided process, radically divided, split down the middle. But as it is, the interdependence of these two sides of things or two ways of looking at things shows that there is something in common between the two and to understand this is the essential key to uh, living in a sane way because if you're insane you're split up an idiot you know the word Greek idiotis is means uh, private purely private uh, isolated, out of communication, out of relationship. And so, uh, this is a way of saying that uh, insanity is a lack of awareness of relativity, because all existence is relationship. Now, if we can take a very fundamental illustration of this, I want you to imagine a universe in which all that there exists is one ball. This ball will, of course, have to be floating in space. Because if there is no space outside the ball, nobody knows that it's a ball. There's no possibility of a ball which has no space beyond it, because then the ball itself, the solid material of the ball, would be all that there was. And there would be nothing outside it. So there would be no way of defining it as a ball. So there has to be our universe, one ball in space, and the space outside the ball, furthermore, must be regarded as depending upon the existence of the ball. The ball and a space go together. Now then, however, there is no way of telling what this ball is doing, whether it's moving or whether it is still. It could be roaring through this space at thousands of miles an hour, and there'd be no way of proving it. There'd be no air friction upon it. There would be nothing uh, relatively stable with which its movement could be compared and against which it could be measured. So this ball has no energy. It can't even uh, be said to be still. It can't be said to be in motion. And of course, this is the situation of the universe as a whole. In the beginning, 
But one of the things that God said before the Bible started, the first thing according to the Bible was let there be light. But actually there were several former pronouncements. Um, one of which was uh, you've got to draw the line somewhere. And the other was have a ball. And this is why uh, most objects of celestial uh, existence are spherical. Don't you think it's very odd to be living on a spherical rock revolving round an enormous spherical fire? <laughs> it's just weird. <laughs> Wake up and find yourself in that situation. <laughs> so, he said, have a ball. Now, this is the fundamental situation. The universe as a whole is presumably some kind of ball. It's curved space, and there it is. And nothing can be said about the whole universe as to whether it is moving or whether it is still. It's neither. That's why the Hindus, in trying to um, make some indication of the ultimate reality, say it is not this, it is not that. It is not one thing, it is not the other. It doesn't exist, it doesn't not exist. It doesn't both exist and not exist. It doesn't neither exist nor not exist. So you can't say anything about it. Your tongue is tied up. That's why it is said in the Muman Khan, which is a great Zen text, that when you've been attained enlightenment, you're like a dumb man who's had a marvelous dream. Everybody who's had a marvelous dream wants to tell everybody about it. But if you're dumb, you can't say a thing. So in the same way, the moment you realize that you are one with all that there is, well, it's this fundamental ball. And you can't say anything about it. Because it isn't moving, it isn't not moving. You can't think about it. Because, and the reason you can't think about it is uh, not because it exceeds you. It's because it is you. You can't get at it like you can't bite your own teeth. So then, if we introduce two balls into our cosmos, then we can say something about motion because it is apparent that they can approach each other or get away from each other. But no one can say which one is doing it or whether both are doing it, because uh, there is no, no way of determining it. One may be still and the other moving to it or away from it. Both may be moving towards each other or away from each other, but there is no way of saying which one starts. And furthermore, they can only move with respect to each other in a straight line. They have no possibility of moving on a surface. They have defined linear motion. Now we will introduce three balls into our system, and suddenly we find uh, not only that they can move uh, on a surface with respect to each other, but also that uh, there's going to be a little fight started. Because if two balls stay together, at a constant space apart, and one ball appears to approach them or to recede from them. Uh, well, here is a problem. Are the two standing still and the one uh, likes them or doesn't like them, so moves closer or away, or is the one standing still and the two moving towards it or away from it? Well, there's only one way in this thing of deciding. Two balls that stay together constitute a majority. And according to the majority vote, they will decide whether they are moving away from the other one or approaching it, or whether it is standing still or whatever. <clears throat> now then, uh, the, the third ball, of course, can lick them by joining them. It can always stay, if it wants to, at a constant space from the other two, unless they break up. <clears throat> and go off in different directions. So long as they stay together, it can stay with them, and then we are back to the original situation, because no one is moving at all, however much they move. Because the three constitute now one constellation, one triangle. All right, introduce a fourth ball. Now we have the possibility of motion in three dimensions. And you would say, well, now this is good, because we've got an umpire. Somebody who stands at the distance of objectivity and looks down upon those three balls and will decide which of them are moving and which of them are still. Very good, but the problem is which one of them is the fourth? Who's the umpire? Everyone 
is in a position of a third dimension to the other three. So everyone is both involved in the game of three and could be the external observer who is the umpire of what the three are doing. Now that is exactly your situation as being sensing yourself as an external observer of the world. And this is a simple basic principle in terms of which all bodies in the cosmos may be understood. It's simply nothing but a multiplication of this situation. It's, very, it's, it's complicated, yes, so that you have to scratch your head uh, to think about it, but it all reduces down to this fundamental uh, mutual motion of balls. So, <clears throat> you see from this what is the meaning of relativity? So, uh, none of the balls, incidentally, have such a thing as a true position. Because the position of any one of the four is where it seems to be from the, the uh, different points of view of each member of the group. The members of the group can get together and agree upon a theoretical uh, positioning of the balls, but they can never directly see all of the balls, including the one that's looking, in this theoretical position, just in the same way as you have a theoretical idea of the dimensions of a room, which would correspond to an architect's ground plan and elevation. And you would say you know that that corner up there is a right angle, although you see it as an obtuse angle. Now, this agreement as to what are the true positions of things is very important because upon such agreement depends all possibilities of human communication. We have to have a standard of what is north, south, east and west, of what is a unit of measure, of what languages and what words or what noises are to mean what experiences. And by constructing this conventional standard of measures, we are able to agree with each other. But one must see at the same time that this is a convention. There is no reason for driving on the right side of the road rather than the left, except that everybody must agree what side they're going to drive on. One isn't really preferable to the other. The point is to agree. So when we agree about certain social conventions, whether they be legal or moral or uh, descriptional, aesthetic, whatever they are, They are a construct, they are an abstraction. And nobody uh, oh, well, let's say they're an abstraction, and it uh, this abstraction is never directly perceived, just as you cannot possibly go up to the ceiling to a position where you can see uh, the whole floor as a rectilinear pattern as it would be drawn in an architect's blueprint. Your vision will always be distorted. If by distortion you mean departure from the blueprint. So then, except in terms of some sort of convention of this kind, there is no such thing as the true position of the four balls in space. Because you must always ask when you ask about truth, truth for whom, 
or truth in relation to what standards? Now, you see, when we measure something by inches, inch numbered one is the same length as the inch numbered two, three, four, etc. When we measure things by the clock, the clock is a circle regularly divided into 360 or multiples thereof uh, degrees. But I've often wondered whether uh, it wouldn't be interesting to have elliptical clocks or May West shaped clocks so that certain times of the day would go faster than others or slower than others. It might be very convenient to have the evening to last longer, uh, slow, slow time down for the evening, you see, speed it up at some other time. Uh, why not? But you see, we try to fit everything into an ideal of regularity. <clears throat> now the next point is that if relationship is existence we are going to discover from this that the existence of any identifiable thing or event in the whole cosmos depends upon and in an opposite sense, is responsible for the existence of everything else. But to do that, we've got to understand another image, which I will illustrate with the parable of a rainbow. Now, you know there's an old philosophical conundrum. If a tree falls in a forest and there is nobody around to hear it, does it make a noise? This is a very simple problem, but it has been discussed in ways that make it very confusing. A noise is a, a neurological experience caused by a vibration of air interacting with an eardrum and an auditory nervous system. So therefore, obviously, when the tree falls, it will set up a vibration in the air. But if this vibration in the air does not pulsate upon an eardrum, there will be no noise. You can see it in a simpler way. What will happen if I hit a skinless drum? There will be a hit but no sound because the drum has no skin. So if there is no eardrum, the vibrations in the air will not make a noise. I don't need to introduce, to prove this, any spookery about mind as distinct from matter or anything like that. That's quite straightforward. But now let's take the somewhat more subtle case of seeing a rainbow. To perceive a rainbow, there must be three variables present, three factors. There must A, be the sun. B, there must be moisture in the atmosphere. <coughs> and funnily enough, C, there must be an observer at a certain angle relative to the angle of the sun and the uh, moisture. The observer will, in other words, be standing shall we say, on a straight line between the sun and the body of moisture uh, and what will then appear to be the center of the rainbow. That's why the side of a rainbow is always off to one side. You never see this, the, the side of a rainbow directly in front of you. So the position of a rainbow differs for every observer. Just in the same way as that the position of this table differs for each one of you in the room. Depends where you're sitting as to where you see it. Now, 
the trouble with this illustration is that a rainbow is a rather diaphanous thing. And we tend to accord it a rather low reality status. And yet it fulfills all the requirements necessary for a genuinely existent thing. Oh, it's true, you can't grab hold of it. But neither can you grab hold of the moon, at least not yet. Now, it has these criteria. It isn't a hallucination, because everybody standing around will curse and swear, may see that at such and such a time and place they veritably do see this rainbow. So it's not like a ghost or a hallucination. <laughs> but everybody sees it in a slightly different place. And you see, if there were no sun shining, there would be no rainbow. If there were no moisture in the atmosphere, there would be no rainbow. But let us suppose that the sun is shining and there is moisture in the atmosphere, but nobody is around. We only say with great reluctance that there would be no rainbow. Because that way of looking at things upholds a particular mythology of the world. The world is something independent of us. Uh, this is the great superstition of Western culture, that the world is independent of you. That you don't make any difference to it. It's just something into which you come, and it's going along and along and along, and you come in and you look, at, you look in the box and say, well, that's the way it is, and then they kick you out again. <clears throat> but now let's set up the situation in another way. Let's suppose the sun is shining out on the ocean somewhere, and I'm on a ship, and I could look over there and I say, my goodness, isn't this a nice day? If there was some moisture right over there, we would have a rainbow. And everybody says, well, there isn't one. It just does not truly exist that there is a rainbow. All right, the sun is shining out on the ocean and there is some moisture. If there were a ship sailing near it so that there could be someone to see, there would be a rainbow. Now, in these two situations... They are both exactly the same. There would be a rainbow if there was some moisture around, but there isn't. And equally, there would be a rainbow if there was someone to see it, and there isn't. Those are two completely equivalent situations. Because it, this isn't, again, a question of spookery. It's a question that the existence of the phenomenon rainbow depends on the presence of three factors. Like the existence of a human being depends on the existence of two factors, a man and a woman. Everybody has to have a father and a mother, or have had. And the otherwise, with the exception of that relationship, you don't exist. Well, now, the case of the rainbow is exactly the same case as everything else. It's just because a rainbow is rather diaphanous and intangible, although it sure hits you in the eye. And the eye, the seeing, is a form of touching. Seeing is touching at a distance. When you find that the table is hard, uh, that is a way of feeling with your fingers the same thing as that you cannot see through it with your eyes. So, uh, we, we, we are funny about this. Purely optical sensations are regarded as having a lesser grade of reality than tactile sensations. When you get hold of something and can grab it and you feel it solid, you feel you are surer of its existence than if you merely see it. But it's all the same thing. Touch is a sensation as if your finger ends were full of millions of little eyes. Every nerve end an eye. And they close around this and they find it is not transparent. Here is a limit. Here is something we don't go through. But that's exactly the same as when you see with these eyes here. You don't see through something. <clears throat> so then, 
the the physical world responding to the sense of touch. I mean, you, you, it's it's another way of saying that the, the the table would not be hard and is not hard except when touched. It is the touch that evokes the hardness in the table. When it is not touched, it's not soft, it's not hard. It has no quality at all. Nothing which is not in relation to us has any existence. Or, I will add, in relation to some other kind of uh, responsive creature. Just in the same way that when light energy uh, goes out of the sun into space, the energy will only be manifested as light if there is some body outside the sun to reflect the light. Otherwise, the light does not in any way illumine the darkness of space. You must bring something into it to manifest the light in space. So a Zen poem says, the tree manifests the bodily power of the wind. The water manifests the spiritual nature of the moon. Because you see, if the wind is blowing, that is to say, an energy is moving along and there is nothing to stand in its way, the energy is not there. The energy in the situation is evoked only by something standing in its way. Then it's manifest. The water manifests the spiritual power of the moon. Why? Because in the breaking waves, the moon can be shattered into thousands of fragments, and yet it always remains one. That's its spiritual power. You wouldn't see that miracle of the moon if it weren't for the waves. And they divide it up like that. All right, you can say, it's a distortion. That's not the way the moon is. The waves are not reflecting it correctly. But that's only trying to say that things reflected in a smooth and still surface are reflected more really than things reflected in a vibrating surface. Okay, if you want to construe it that way, it's your, your privilege. But you can have any kind of reflector you want. So in the same way, it is with you. What you see, therefore, depends on the way your senses are constructed. You have certain kinds of sense organs, and these sense organs evoke the kind of universe appropriate to them. It's not necessarily the way things are. Because there is no way that things are apart from their impact or better relationship with some kind of perceiver or perceiving organism. Because things are only in relation. When there is nothing to which they can relate, nothing is happening. And the, the so-called existence which we perceive and that to which it is related come into being together. <clears throat> Now, is that to say that uh, before any living organisms existed, there wasn't any universe? Is that to say that all our knowledge of the prehistoric and geological past of the world and the cosmos before life came to it is nothing but an extrapolation? That is to say, uh, all we are saying is that this is what would have been happening if there had been people around to see it. But since there weren't, since there was no living organism around to witness this, nothing was going on. Now it's possible to make a very good case for that point of view. But I would like to be a little more modest and not 
make it quite that uh, radical. And I would say rather this. There would never have been a universe before living beings existed unless there was going to be a creature called man. Man living in a future, say, implies uh, in the past a certain state of affairs. In other words, this planet had to come into being with an adequate amount of uh, temperature, oxygen, gases, everything else, food supplies, for the organism called man to exist. So let me say then, the existence of man implies a certain kind of environment, uh, meteorological, geological, and astronomical. But the other side of this proposition is that such an environment implies man. Now, where you get two sides of a situation where they imply each other mutually, you have, in fact, a truly relational and unitary system. Well, then, therefore, the answer to this problem is that prior to the existence of any form of life, the universe at that time is dependent upon the fact that those forms of life are going to emerge. Now, this is a thing that uh, is very difficult for us to understand because we think of reality proceeding uh, <clears throat> forward into the future, but dependent only upon the past. It's very difficult for us to see that events that we call past are dependent upon events in the future. That a lot of things would never started unless certain results were going to happen. Again, this is another of those ideas which is an affront to common sense. But uh, there are a number of ways of showing that it's quite a sensible idea. Uh, unless you were, if you know, you're flying an aeroplane, you leave London, you arrive in New York. You wouldn't have started out from London unless you had known in advance there was a place called New York where you could land. So in a very similar way, the energy system of the universe does not start out with certain, say, very primitive amoebic creatures until it knows that it can arrive. I don't know where, where it's going on beyond man, but at least it's got to get as far as man. Because if it's not going to be able to do that, it won't even start. Now, you can put this in other terms. An electric current. Uh, the electricity isn't like water. When you turn on the faucet, the water goes right down the hose and waits at the nozzle. So as soon as you turn on the nozzle, there's the water. But an electric current isn't like that. When you've got two wires, I mean two terminals, positive and negative, and you've got the positive one hitched up, and here's your wire, and you leave the end of that wire just an inch away from the negative terminal. There is no electric, electric current moving. It hasn't flowed down the wire from the positive terminal so that it waits to be ready to jump. The trouble with is that, uh, is that electricity moves so fast we don't see these things. And it, you can only see it if you do it on a colossal scale. Let's supposing that we had an electric wire that was, uh, oh... 300 million miles in length. 
Now we connect it at the positive end. Nothing at all happens. Connect it at the negative end. So that too can have possibility. See, that's the other terminal. Then immediately the circuit starts. But the circuit of electric current does not start until there is a place for it to, ro- to arrive. See, that's the point. So in exactly the same way, it, may, see, it makes no difference whether the wire be something that uh, is 180,000 miles and is traversed in one second, or whether it's 60 billion miles that will take a somewhat longer time. In either case, the current will not start until the receptor terminal, the minus terminal, is secured. So in this way, I I would say, in just exactly the same way, life will not start up in a universe uh, to which it really doesn't belong, in which it uh, can be regarded as nothing more than a stranger. So if you follow that out, you see this, that the whole existence of the universe depends on every individual. It isn't a question of how long you last, that the universe will only last as long as you do. That's not the point. The universe is much bigger than you are, and you are very small, but at this moment it depends on you. The universe is much longer than you are, and you are very short in time. But nevertheless, it depends on you. The universe in the future, long after you're dead, will still be depending on the fact that you once existed. The universe in the past, existing long before you were ever thought of, still depends on the fact that one day you would exist. And it depends on each person. So, in other words, uh, there is, uh, in, in everything that happens, uh, every whole depends on every part. Because, you see, in truth, there are no parts of the universe. Parts are an abstract creation. When we think of someone or something as a part, we are quite arbitrarily cutting him off and saying, By convention, we will agree that our skins uh, are our boundary, and therefore, since our skins do not include the whole cosmos, we are only a part of it. But there are no parts. Just as in your own, when you study your own organism, uh, all of it's continuous. All the so-called parts flow into the others, like the motions of waves. You not have detachable parts that you can unscrew inside you, you see? Unless you've got false teeth or something like that, then you can take it out, see? But in the ordinary way, you can't unscrew parts of the human being from another. They're continuous. Well, in exactly the same way, you are continuous with this environment. And although we have been habituated to looking upon ourselves as separate things, we are no more separate from what's going on around us than each of these waves here are separate from the ocean or that Mount Tamalpais is separate from the planet Earth. (coughs) We have great freedom of movement, so do the waves. So do the gulls floating in the air. So do the trees waving in the wind. We have a larger degree of freedom than that, because we are more volatile. But we are just as much waves in the total process. It depending upon us, and we, in turn, depending upon it. Now understand the meaning of there being no parts. All parts are ideas. We have an idea of a part. We uh, chop things up and say one human being, two human beings, three human beings, and so on, and so think of it as parts. But that's not the way it works. 
You can see this from the most elementary neurology by understanding that uh, it is the way you are as a living body that evokes the kind of universe that you see. It is your body which turns the sun into light, which turns it into heat, which turns water into wet and rocks into hard. And in turn, your body is uh, one of the pulsations of nature along with the sun, the rocks, the water, etc. So there's a mutual arrangement. It creates you, or evokes you, or does you, whatever word you want to use, and at the same moment, you do it, and you do all of it. So this is why uh, there was some kind of truth in astrology. I say this, but at the same time, I certainly don't consult astrologers and uh, plot my life by the crude calculations of hor horoscopy. Uh, but uh, because you, you, if you do that, you... you get into endless tangles of self-deception because it isn't accurate. Uh, but it has a principle. In it. The astrologer was right. When he drew a map of your soul, he drew a crude map of the universe. He drew the universe as it was at the time and place of your birth. The universe as it was, as seen from the point of view where you were born. And that was your soul. So your soul, you see, is not in your body. Your body is in your soul because your soul is the entire network of relationships in terms of which you live. Your soul is the whole universe. But each one of us, as it were, is a different point in it. But all these points in it are the center. We can go way beyond Ptolemy and Copernicus now. And if we think that space is curved, every point of space is the center of the universe because any point on a ball is the center of the sphere, of the surface. See? You can turn any point of a ball, and wherever you look at it, it's the center, isn't it? See? So in the same way, take a crystal ball in your hand, a crystal mirror. Uh, no, I'm, what I mean is not a crystal mirror, I mean a spherical mirror. Look at it. And wherever you turn it, your face will be in the middle. So in exactly the same way, every place in the universe is the middle of the universe from a standpoint of curved space. So uh, we go back to uh, an entirely new uh, Ptolemaic view of the world beyond Copernicus. Well, not that the Earth is the... Yes, the Earth is the center of the universe. But every other place is also the center of the universe. There is no absolute center. So this is a, an astronomical way of saying, uh, in Sanskrit, tattvamasi, you're it. Everyone is rightly the center. You may think, uh, my mother used to say to me, you're not the only pebble on the beach. <laughs> no, indeed. But, uh, uh, but, in an, but in a way, everyone is the central pebble. And the feeling that you have of being uh, the center, which turns out into selfishness and all the sort of conflict and uh, scrapping, is nevertheless based on something true. What we do is we misinterpret it. We don't realize uh, that everybody else is the center too. In that sense, you're not the only pebble on the beach. You're not the only center of the universe. And yet there is only one center. And that's why... Um, who was it? I think it was St. Bonaventure who first thought up the description or the definition of God as that circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And 
This is a poem that I seem to remember from Alfred Noyes. Where, said the king, oh, where, I have not found it. Here, said the dwarf, and music echoed here. This infinite circle hath no line to bound it. Behold its strange deep center everywhere. <coughs> so this, then, you see, as I, what I'm playing with here, is what the Buddhists call the Jiji Muge. <coughs> that means, a G means a thing event. And you repeat it twice, so it means between thing event and thing event, muge, there is no mutual obstruction. Um, this is called the doctrine of the mutual interpenetration of all things and events. So it would be like those lovely drawings where you take a circle uh, and you can play with this. It's a nice thing to play with. And you mark out 12 equal points around the circumference of the circle. Then you join every point to every other point. You get this beautiful star. And incidentally, this is the diagram of the notes of the, tw uh, the 12 notes of the scale. Um, Bach worked this out. And uh, it's a lovely thing, you see, this beautiful star. So this is the diagram of the way it all fits together. Now, if you study that, and by study again, I mean not just think about it, but feel it out, you, you will find very strange thing happening. <coughs> that... Uh, you will find that the present moment, with all its particularity in which you live and are functioning now, is exactly the same thing as anything you could possibly conceive of as eternity. You will find that your limited life, and remember what I said about limits, you have to have something to push against. Your limited life with its frustrations and with its particular problems at this instant, is the same thing as omnipotence. And that your situation in space, which is, uh, appears to be in Sausalito, California, sitting on a boat which has a rickety old thing, and miles and miles away is China and Russia and England and... Uh, Mars, Venus, and everything. Yeah. But this particular point in space, you will find in the same way, by this law of relativity, is the same thing as infinity. Infinite space. Because it all goes together. It implies the infinite, the eternal. All the energy of the universe is implied in uh, any tiny hair on your, uh, on your skin. It goes with it mutually implies, this is the point. Just as the kind of uh, cosmos and uh, atmosphere in which we live, I, my, my existence implies that kind of a, an environment, so the environment implies me, mutually. And it all goes together. Now, the, 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 the only reason for saying this, you see, uh, this is really terribly obvious. But the only reason for saying it is that people don't know it. And think instead that uh, they don't belong. That this, um, you know, I'm just uh, because of the, the parents put down the children and said, little children should be seen and not heard. You don't belong here. Like I read the other day in some paper, somebody was saying, <laughs> uh, some young person was addressing a girl and saying, he was trying to make love to her. He was trying to woo her. And she said, you, you, you won't be friends with me because you say I, I, I don't like your personality. But he um, said, uh, you don't have to have a personality. A personality is something you had to put on because your mother didn't love you. 
and you had to make up to her. Really, you 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 don't need a personality because you're 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 the essential thing. You see, <laughs> and and a personality is just a a way of of, of performing to uh, uh, ingratiate yourself. Well, we all do it because we put on personalities when we act like clowns and entertain the audience, put on masks, funny faces. But really and truly, the mask covers the one self that we all have and we all know it. Only... Uh, just like black and white, we are pretending to be as different as possible while remaining the same. I said that one of the aspects of cosmic gamesmanship that we were going to deal with would be group theory. And of course, I don't mean exactly by that a sort of mathematical meaning. But the, the, the relationship uh, that's tremendously important and that is not sufficiently recognized between in-groups and out-groups. You know how you've heard about little birds where they're cold and they're all huddling together, the idea being to see who can get most inside. <laughs> and uh, human beings are just like that. And so also is everything else. <laughs> uh, because... This is a, an absolutely basic requirement of having an identity. To have an identity is in some way or other to be in. I often try the experiment in giving a lecture of drawing a circle on the blackboard and asking the assembled multitudes what I have, what I have drawn. And people will almost invariably say, that I have drawn a circle, a ring, or a ball. Only very rarely does some bright person suggest that I have drawn a wall with a hole in it. Because uh, the Gestalt theory of perception shows us that our attention is captured by enclosed areas as against open areas, and by moving objects rather than still. And so always, therefore, we tend to prefer the in-situation. That is something, you see. Uh, the, the, the star is an in-situation with respect to space. The space is the out-situation. And so we feel that space is not important, it is nothing, it is uh, just unimportant in a way. But the in situation is something. So then whenever human beings get into an out situation, like being a rejected minority, living on the wrong side of the tracks, they will find reasons for convincing themselves that their situation is the truly in one, and that the people who claim to be in are really out. So, as I have sometimes said before, I hope this uh, doesn't bore too many of you, but uh, in Sausalito we have exactly that situation. We have the hillbillies, who are the old-time people, who regard themselves as in, because they have the money and they live in the fancy houses up on the hill. And then we have the waterfront people, whom they regard as out, as a, a nefarious bunch of beatniks and bohemians and scallywags. And uh, so uh, the people at the hill top uh, fortify themselves at their cocktail parties with conversation about how awful the people are down on the waterfront. And at the cocktail parties down on the waterfront, uh, people fortify themselves by discussing the squares on the hill. And uh, we believe uh, down here that we have the true way of life, that uh, we are not beating our heads out making money to buy pseudo-rocket ships. Although I do own a pseudo-rocket ship, but it was wished on me. <laughs> because, you see, I try to be a bridge person. That's what's called a pontifex. 
one who, uh, <laughs> between opposed classes, points out the connections. Because the connection is that neither class would know who they were without the other. So it's tremendously necessary to have an out-group in order to know that you're an in-group. In other words, if you belong to the church, which is the assembly of the elect of God, or if you belong to the synagogue, which is to be a member of the chosen people, an outsider, all those guys, then uh, you know you're in. You see? But you must have the outsiders to know that you're in. There must, in other words, be beyond the pale of the village, the howling waste. And then you feel cozy, you feel protected, you feel you're there. And so in that way, bodies have skins, eggs have shells, and so on all through nature. Inside versus outside. But this versus must be understood as a form of symbiosis. And this is the crucial matter. This is absolutely of critical importance to anyone who wants to understand politics or military strategy or any of the real hard, tough games of life. That uh, social conflict or conflict between the various biological species is a form of symbiosis. <coughs> now, ordinarily, we consider the symbiotic relationship to be one of mutual support, as is obviously the case between bees and flowers. <coughs> which came the first, bee or flower? This is the same question as which came the first, egg or hen? Because where there are no flowers, there can't be bees. And where there are no bees or other fertilizing insects, there cannot be flowers. So the truth of the matter is that bees and flowers, different as they are in appearance, and separated as they may be in space, they constitute a single organism. This is the real lesson of the bees and the flowers. <coughs> and uh, the same must be said truly of man and woman. There are no men without women. There are no women without men because it always takes a man and a woman to produce a human being. So we are a man-woman arrangement, a woman-man arrangement, whichever way you want to look at it. And so although, you see, therefore, we move and look as if we're individuals uh, and separate from each other, this is not the case at all. So, now this, uh, what I want to point out is that the same sort of relationship exists between groups that would seem to be hostile to each other now, what are some of the bases of hostility? The real basis of hostility is that the biological order is a mutual eating society. It's a very curious game indeed. And if you are philosophically inclined, it is one which might bother your conscience. When you realize that you as an organism are com a compound of murders... Uh, you are actually a bag of water because the human organism consists mostly of water. And this water is held together and presented from slobbering, prevented from slobbering all over the floor by a very complex arabesque of tubes and cells and films, the material of which was invariably belonging to some other being before you got it. You had to kill a chicken, a cow, or a cabbage, or an apple in order to get that tensile film of tube or whatever to hold the water in you and as you. And so uh, we are, as human beings, a predatory creature. In fact, we are more predatory than anything else in nature. The sharks are supposed to be predatory, but they stay in the ocean. The piranha fish are supposed to be very predatory, but they stay in the Amazon. The eagles are predatory, but they stay in the air and on the land. Only man ranges the whole uh, range of elements, earth, air, and water. 
and preys on things, and he eats like a swarm of locusts. Not only does he prey on the living beings, he play, preys on the minerals. And uh, someone recently described our, our civilization as a lot of people sitting in the middle of a sewage dump shooting rockets at the moon. <laughs> because if you, you read, get Playboy magazine for um, September and read about the use of water, or rather the misuse of water, in our civilization. And it is absolutely horrifying. We've got to get that atomic power bringing us water from the ocean in nothing flat, or we're going to be very thirsty. And you can see how uh, uh, we use water in the most amazingly uneconomical ways. So we are a predatory monster eating up the planet. And uh, I have seen, uh, say, a sorrel plant uh, in the country covered with green fly. One day it is full of little green succulent bodies having a ball. A day or two later, stalk with grey dust all over it. See, they've eaten up, they multiply to the point of eating up the plant, and so they turn into grey dust. Human beings could do just exactly the same thing. And the reason why human beings are in danger of this is that they have refused membership in a mutual eating society. They want to be top and only eater and do not want to be eaten. So that instead nowadays of returning what you ate to the earth, we return our remains to the earth in an unassimilable form. Our remains include not only mummified, formaldehyded bodies, courtesy of the morticians, uh, encased in concrete so that no worms even can mm. get in, but also the fact that many things that we return to the earth are no longer in the organic cycle. For example, rust does not assimilate properly. Uh, all sorts of chemicals, all sorts of gases that we give off do not return into the organic cycle. And we are ruining, uh, we, are, we are actually abolishing animals. Wild animals have less and less of a prospect of living. Wild birds are being greatly reduced in numbers. Whales have almost, are ceasing to exist because the whaling industry is getting rid of them. And what is more, some of the animals we farm, like chickens, are no longer chickens. They are strictly non-chickens which lay pseudo-eggs because they are raised in enormous wire cell blocks and fed on chemicals under the superstition that anything fed to a chicken will turn into chicken, and it won't. That is why you may have noticed that the chickens you buy don't taste like chickens could taste, especially those that have been allowed to run around in the sunlight and scratch. Those can become real chickens. Uh, because, you see, the, the necessary thing about any species that you live on is that you must love it. I love you so much I could eat you. Or, I eat you so much I could love you. But where you get things raised without love, you cannot love a whole cell block of chickens. You cannot love wheat when it is grown in vast wastelands or out of any trees and it is sheared off the earth and then uh, winnowed and uh, reduced to pancake makeup and then chemicals are added to it and it is converted into the styrofoam material called bread. <laughs> Now, uh, you know, like one converts milk into casein, so one converts wheat or rye into a plastic material, which is a kind of universal solvent, which is nothing at all and tastes of nothing at all. In fact, you know when you feed babies that kind of nasty white pablum, and you feed it and they always spit it back into the spoon? Well, our, our white bread it reduces itself to that instantly on the contact with liquid and becomes a miserable paste. It's not bread at all. So, uh, if, if, if you are unwilling, you see, to join the Mutual Eating Society, and you want to conquer everything and not be eaten by anything, the penalty you pay for this is uh, the annihilation of your species. And you eventually annihilate through eating things that taste like chalk and string.
That's what it will come to. Because you don't love what you eat. You have no respect for the raw materials. So, uh, what we do, haven't understood then is that all groups need an enemy group. But that the enemy group which preys upon it is actually a kind of friend. Because the enemy group prunes your own group. It keeps your population at a reasonable level and it keeps you on your toes because you have to defend yourself against it so you don't become flabby. But you see, in, uh, uh, we, we have lost the meaning of chivalry in all uh, war situations and all conflict situations. Chivalry is indicated, for example, still in such customs as that the partners to a fight salute each other before beginning to fight and salute each other again at the end. Uh, you shake hands before boxing. Uh, you um, do these various things. You bow before a judo contest and so on. And that means that you recognize the opponent as an honorable opponent as somebody with whom uh, a fight is a really important matter. And that is uh, really one of the most essential laws of survival. To recognize that enemies, unless they are predatory locusts, who have no respect, who do not, in other words, farm the species that they prey upon. That's the essence of the thing. You must cherish the species you prey upon. You must see, like, for example, in, in lumbering, you must re-sow. You must plant a, a tree for every tree you take. That is cherishing the species. And if you farm cows, you don't uh, treat your cows, you often treat them better than you would your servants, because the servants can go hang uh, but the cows are valuable, and so you nurture them because they're going to sell as beef and they're going to provide milk or whatever it is. So the, the perception of the fact that it is absolutely necessary to have an out-group for your having an in-group and that you cannot do without it is the beginning of sociability. And so what you get then in that case is a situation of contained conflict. A conflict gets out of hand when an in-group does not realize that it needs the out-group. Then it says, let's get rid of the out-group. Uh, get the dirty communists off the face of the earth. But do you realize what a fix we'd be in without communists? The whole economy would fall apart because there would be no external threat. And the communists are in exactly the same situation. Their kind of politics would fall apart unless there were some wretched capitalistic imperialists with whom they could contra contrast themselves and against whom they could organize their energies. Because it is a curious thing that it's very difficult to get human beings to organize their energies for something pleasant. It's only under the fear, under external threat to their life that human beings will really get busy and cooperate. <laughs> so, the solidarity of any group of human beings depends to an enormous extent on an external menace. And therefore that menace is friendly to the solidarity and the cooperative enterprise of the group. And this will be true of big groups as well as of small groups. Even people who say, uh, say in matters of religion, <coughs> that religious exclusivism is bad, that bigotry is terrible, those same people are actually playing a game called, I'm more tolerant than you. And so constitute an in-group of the tolerant, opposed to the out-group of the bigots. There's no way of getting away from this, except by transcending it with a sort of humor. 
When you see that the two groups need each other, you start laughing. When, for example, if uh, I have people who argue with me with contrary opinions and who belong to different religions, I can't get mad about it because I realize that I wouldn't know what I thought unless somebody disagreed with me. And therefore, your disagreement is necessary to the preservation of my opinions. And this is, a, this is the secret of humor. <laughs> so, when you realize that, you are given one of the most important clues that there is to the nature of yourself. Now, you see, we are all brought up in a huge historical, cultural, linguistic background which has a very powerful influence upon the way in which we experience self. And we experience self as an enclosed island confronted by an enormous outgroup called the universe. Within me, within my body, is a palpitating, soft, sensitive reality. There is the self. But outside, <coughs> I don't feel. When I hit you, you suffer, but I don't. It's the outside is therefore somehow alien. And it has been drilled into us, therefore, that the world as a physical entity or process is an organization that goes on and on and on probably through all eternity. But that the individual is in it as a brief occurrence and is furthermore, as man, a tiny little germ living on a, an obscure rock revolving around an unimportant star on the fringe of one of the minor galaxies and that the other galaxies are much bigger and that there are more of them than you can think of. And so this puts us in this extremely remote position. As if to say, you don't really belong at all. Now, I explained yesterday a new cosmology where we can surely say that any point in the universe can be regarded as the center of it. There is no absolute center. But all points are the center. And so in the same way, uh, if we can see that, we can make a very curious psychological readjustment to our life situation. And learn how what it is that we call I is not a poor little puppet. But that the situation of i that is to say, of feeling central to all things, is a, a kind of distortion of the true situation. which is that i and being, i and uh, existence are the same thing. Only, uh, just as the sense of self requires the sense of other, the sense of being here 
requires also the interval of apparent nothingness, which we call death. Life goes with death in the same sense as self goes with other. We saw there has to be this yang yin rhythm, the crest of the wave and the trough of the wave. The crest is the life, the trough is the death, the interval. Someone has asked me uh, what I think about uh, the um, survival of the individual personality. Uh, and so you see this problem of death is very critical to us. But you have to understand it and approach it by seeing that the real you is not the individual. If, for example, we draw a circle and that circle represents the universe, then we draw rays coming from that circle in such a way that you are drawing tangents to the circle which meet at points outside it. So making a star in which each ray is uh, a point which focuses the entire diameter of the star. Now turn it inside out so that the rays go inwards into the circle. So that inside the circle, the whole circle focuses itself at innumerable points within it. And then you have something like what we are. I said, using the astrological illustration, that the um, soul is not in the body, but the body is in the soul. The soul is the whole universe. Focused at a particular time and a particular place, a here and now. And that is what you really are. In other words, those galaxies that uh, are immensely far off and uh, which you could think would have nothing to do with you at all. All that's in you. And what you call your body, your brain, your nervous system and so on, is in you too. Now you can never get at, just as we, we can't get at the whole universe, in the sense that uh, if there is only one ball in space and that one ball constitutes the whole universe, I showed you that we couldn't say whether that ball was moving or standing still because there is nothing else in relation to which it moves or stands still. So there's something about the universe as a totality which is always indescribable and ungetable. Now that is the same indescribability and ungetatability as your own mind. There is no way, in other words, just as we cannot find a name for the color of vision, the color of the lens of the eye, and so we call it transparent, no color. Of course we have to, because in the same way a mirror is, has no color, otherwise it would not be able to reflect colors. So, at the root of all experience whatsoever, there is the non-experience, which is fundamental to it. It can never be described in terms of any of the uh, experiences within it, but it's basic. And it lies between light and darkness, coming and going, life and death. But there is no way of your, as it were, possessing it. And you have to realize that there is no way of your possessing it for the very simple reason that it is you. So, because 
of the invisible and intangible nature of this reality, one tends to forget all about it. And to become fascinated instead with um, subsidiary features inside it. Because it has no color, no shape, uh, at least none that uh, could be defined, because it would have to get out itself, outside itself to define its shape. And therefore, all practical purposes, it doesn't have any shape. Therefore, it slips out of attention, and especially out of uh, conscious attention, because as I've pointed out to you, conscious attention always is a concentration on figures in contrast with backgrounds. And so, naturally the total background of everything that's going on, this is again what Tillich means by the ground of being, uh, escapes attention. It is the very first thing we fail to notice. And so in this way we become absolutely fascinated with all the things going on inside it. And we start identifying with them and taking sides as if, for example, uh, again, when you uh, read the newspaper and you read out about all the terrible things <coughs> going on, uh, you find you get worked up. You get mad about this, that, and the other. And uh, before you know where you are, you're completely absorbed. It's just in the same way as going to a play or in the cinema. You, know, you, you get infuriated. You get excited. You get uh, so on, but you've identified you see, with the contests going on. If you could look with, at your blood with a microscope and see all the different kinds of creatures in your blood eating each other up, you would think that you were in grave mortal danger if that side is going to win. <laughs> Wowee, look at that poor thing. And that's part of me. <laughs> <laughs> and so you get absorbed, you get partisan in that quarrel. So we're all in this way absorbed in the daily events going on, the conflicts and everything like this, and we're taking sides. Not realizing, you see, that you can't actually take sides because you need both sides. You are both sides. You are self and other. You are inside and outside. How can you take the side of the outside against the inside? Because if you won, you wouldn't be outside. You wouldn't be inside either. <laughs> so then, the, 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 the project of ways of liberation like Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism is to restore to the fascinated individual an awareness of his eternity. And his infinity. Not necessarily in terms of what we ordinary, ordinarily call personal immortality. A system in which we would be able to go on into a future life with memories of all the past lives through which we have lived. Or past times in which we have been. So that I could address myself to the pleasures of heaven in the person of Alan Watts. I think there might be something mutually exclusive about that. <laughs> uh, but in another way, a much more interesting way, because you, you well know if you think it through, that if you remembered forever and ever uh, and had a kind of continuous, accumulative experience that after a while you would want to forget things that had happened. You see, forgetting is as important to remembering as elimination is to assimilation. Just as uh, you don't simply eat food, but you let out the excrement, 
So in the same way, in ones that we were discussing this morning, well, somebody brought it up, an analogy between the mind and the digestive system. So forgetting is tremendously important to one's mental functioning. That's why we sleep. That's why we have these intervals of unconsciousness. <coughs> and unconsciousness renews things. You remember, don't you, your childhood, when the world was new to you, and how extraordinary it was, and how very beautiful. Well, if you want to go on being an adult for always and always and always, you can never have that experience again. Because you've got to die first. And see it all anew. And that is why uh, all initiation ceremonies involve a symbolic death. What you call dying to yourself. In various rituals, people are put in coffins. And all books of the dead like the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Egyptian Book of the Dead, actually are coded references to initiation rites and initiation processes, whereby you die to come alive. And that is, for, for this reason, thinking about death is extremely productive. Uh, you, you know it's so difficult to think about death, isn't it? Imagine what it would be like for consciousness to cease and never occur again. To go to sleep and never wake up. This is a consideration which teases you out of thought. What would it be like to start out of nothing at all? As it seems that you did when you were born. That equally teases you out of thought. What is outside space? You see, all these questions which are beloved of children bring you to a point where you have to stop thinking. You can't possibly imagine. It. And that is a creative moment when thought is nonplussed. Because what you have got to at that point is yourself. Just in the same way as you cannot conceive yourself in its vastest sense, in the sense of being one with the universe. So you cannot conceive these particular questions that I have raised. And you will find, if you think long enough, about death, about the possibility of your total disappearance, and which will, so far as you're concerned, be the total disappearance of everything else. There's a clue in that, you see, as to who you are. If you think long enough about that, there will occur a curious flip. Yang leads to yin. You will realize that the infinite nothingness into which you will disappear when you die was the same infinite nothingness out of which you came when you were born. Do you remember not existing for millions and millions of years before you were born? You see how it flips? And so you will see the rhythm of this. That you know, of course, from objective observation, that after you are dead, there will be babies born. Baby humans, baby snakes, baby beetles, baby spiders, baby fish, billions of babies. You've watched people die, and you've watched babies born later. So then, you will be every one of those babies. Only one of the interesting properties of being a baby individual is that you can only experience yourself one at a time. <coughs> That's the game. There would be no point in experiencing yourself as many eyes simultaneously, because the nearest thing to that would, of course, have being the self of all the cells in your body, which are coagulated into one individual. 
But you are all of those ones that are born. But each one, of course, experiences itself in the singular. So you can expect very well after you're dead to have the same experience in general as you had when you were born. Now, it may be that you are born again as a human being, or you may be reborn as a fish. But if you are a fish, you will be in a situation where you feel that you're a human being <laughs> and that people are fish. I mean, they're something else. They're another species. You are the center species, which is the human situation. So it will be like it is now. It keeps repeating itself, only it does it with variations on a theme. That's the reason for the many different species, many different kinds of consciousness. But so you do not need, if you understand the sense of this, you do not need to believe in any secret supernatural information which I might have access to and you don't. It is perfectly obvious what's going on. You would say, but uh, there is no connection between me and somebody else living later. My dear friends, there is no connection between the molecules composing your hands. There are no strings joining them together. There is nothing but space between them. There is, as I talk, no connection between the sounds I'm uttering because they are vibrations. And if you magnified the sounds, I'm saying, that means you would have to slow them down on a recording system. You would eventually get something that would go, uh, 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 And you see, I can gargle that a little so that you can, I get deep bass enough, you can actually hear the texture of the sound. That is to say, you're beginning to hear the spaces in the vibration. And what is the connection between these things? Well, you say, as you listen to it while I'm talking to you, it makes perfect sense. Or it's just one sound. Ah! Sounds like it's one sound, continuous, but it's not. It's discontinuous. But when you look at it from far enough away, it looks like it's continuous. So it is with connections between lives. With connections between anything whatsoever. There are no connections. You can look at the universe from it, the prickly philosophy point of view and see it as purely discontinuous particles. Put, 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 put. Machinery. But if you are a goo type person, you see it as all continuous. wavy. You see, instead of going put, put, put. <laughs> but both points of view are correct. So if you want to be continuous, you go a little bit to goo. If you want to be discontinuous, and some people would much rather be dead when they're dead, then <laughs> you can go over to particles. But you must realize, you see, that the differentiation between particles and waves is a differentiation that is necessary to both sides of the difference. You'll always find this is so. Whatever kind of duality you make, you will never be able to escape non-duality, which is what holds dualities together. So, cheer up. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the whole system is rigged. That, uh, you're it. Only uh, you, you learn to be bugged. Yes, to be bugged. To uh, be phased by eventualities. See? Well, suppose when you're a baby, you see, this is pushed into you by the whole society. The babies know, you see, when they first arrive in the world. The babies know that they can't say because they don't have any language. But they know who they are. They have what Freud calls the oceanic experience. I don't know really how he found this out. <laughs> but, uh, 
Sí. <laughs> the, the whole problem of a child psychologist is that um, we would just love to teach an infant to talk so that it can tell it how it feels not to be able to talk. <laughs> how things are before you get any concepts. And so we have a kind of a theoretical notion that a baby experiences the whole world as its own body. And that makes no differentiation between itself and its mother. And so on. Uh, maybe. Very probable. Uh, as a matter of inference. Because none of us remember quite how it was. We, don't, we can't remember because we didn't have any words to put our memories into. No notation. Memory depends to a large extent on such notations. Well, you can get regressions by hypnosis and uh, maybe they tell us something, maybe they don't. But at any rate, uh, what happens is that as you start to grow up, you... Let me put it like this. I think I can get this across. To a baby, nothing has any special value. Life is just a thing that goes... See? There's something just happening. There's just a play of energy. See? And uh, there's nothing to say in it that this is the right noise and that's the wrong noise. This is the right shape and this is the wrong shape. It's all just shape. It's jazz with no discrimination as to what ought to happen, what ought not to happen. When the baby's in pain, it hasn't yet been taught that pain is bad. The baby just squawks. And squawking isn't necessarily bad until mamas teach babies that they ought not to squawk. Then squawking becomes bad. Now, when you get enlightened at the other end of the, of the road, you will once again see that everything that's going on is just in all kinds of ways. Marvelous. It has no value. There's no, it doesn't have to go on. But as a matter of fact, if it stops, stopping means going on later. It's just an interval. There's nothing except intervals. You can't, just as there's nothing outside space, you can't stop permanently. Supposing the, the, you, you take the theory that the universe is called the um, explosion theory of the universe that there was a big bang sometime or other, and that all these galaxies were flung into space, and they are systems of falling energy. And eventually they'll fade out. And that'll be that. Well, then what? Well, but then how did it ever get to start? I mean, presumably before it all happened, there was nothing going on, which will be the way it is when it stops. Anything that happened once can happen again. So, I mean, you, you may say, I can't prove that. You may say, that is my metaphysical leap of faith, that anything that happened once can happen again. But I, I would like to be able to bet on it if I could find some way of collecting the winnings. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, if I lose, I'll never know I lost. <laughs> but I think this is the way it works, because everything works that way. Only the thing is that don't, don't, don't worry about not retaining your personal identity, because you would get absolutely bored with it if you could. Enough of it would kill you, and indeed does. <laughs> so, uh, in that uh, Far Eastern philosophy, human life is looked upon very much as one looks on the seasons. And uh, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And as there is felt, especially in Japanese poetry, to be an absolutely essential rhythm in the rhythm of the seasons, so too there is felt to be this marvelous rhythm in, in the biological cycle, in the life cycle. And uh, 
you will disappear. But you will reappear. And the interesting thing about it is this. You could reappear in a form very like what you are now. Just in the same way as two performances of a given musical piece are different performances and yet the same composition. And there are all possibilities of making this energy system uh, go into every conceivable kind of complexity and differences of shapes and differences of games and every conceivable sort of possibility. And it's going wah, 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 all through time. <laughs> Now, the moment you, you see, this is an essential step, you might call it, in the meditation process, is to see this. Is to see everything as nonsense, as completely meaningless. The being just what it is, is what Buddhists call seeing things as of one suchness. The word suchness in Sanskrit is tathata, and that means da-da-da. See? Da-da-da, 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 like this. When you get to seeing everything like that, when nothing matters, it doesn't matter if you die this instant, because that will be one kind of a jazz. If you go on living a long time, it'll be more kind of jazz. If this happens, if that happens, it's all just a kind of jazz, you see. You get to being able to see that. And simultaneously with seeing that, it becomes perfectly obvious that you sitting here are a continuous life with everything else all around you. One life. But that... The jazz, which is called feeling that I am myself, is a way of going booey, 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 this way. And then feeling there's something other is a thing that goes to rapata, 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 like that, you see. But it's all, as it were, um, bonging on the same drum. <laughs> and you're the drum. Well, now, following on from our discussion yesterday afternoon about relativity and about the mutual interpenetration of every individual thing or event in the universe with every other one and having previously discussed in the morning the yang-yin principle, the interrelation of the opposites, we are in a position to take a look at the meaning of this extraordinary classic of China, the Book of Changes. called the Yi Jing, not the Wai Ching. Uh, <coughs> I'm afraid that the way that we Romanize Chinese words uh, bears very little resemblance to the way they're pronounced. Uh, that's because the scholars have a secret conspiracy to outgroup everybody else, because only if you're in the know do you know how to, the fact that it should be Jing when there's no apostrophe after the CH, but Ching when there is an apostrophe after the CH. And so it goes. So the Yi Jing, or the book, or Jing means a, a classical book, a scripture. The Sanskrit Sutra is tra translated into Chinese by Jing. So uh, the classical book. The book of Yi, which is change. It is suspected that the character for Yi was once a picture of a chameleon or lizard. And that uh, because in the same way that the chameleon changes its color on whatever background it's put, so it came to mean change. But you see, in that idea of change, it isn't simple change. There's an idea of adaptation, an idea of harmonization with surroundings. And one of the basic ideas of Chinese thought about nature is uh, a word that means resonance, as when tuning forks respond to each other. And so the resonance between any individual event and the context in which it occurs is one of the most important things that strike the Chinese mind. For example, if we take blood, blood in the veins is not the same thing as blood in a test tube. Because it's in a different environment, it is not behaving in the same way. And to a very large extent is, uh, you, you must say, that a thing is what it does. 
This, uh, I never tire of pointing out this fundamental confusion in our thinking by reason of the fact that grammar contains both nouns and verbs and therefore gives the impression that there are two quite distinct classes of reality. One is process, uh, denoted by verbs. The other is uh, stuff, objects, entities, denoted by nouns. But actually, uh, there is no need for this division because all nouns, all so-called things, are processes. They are particular forms of behavior. And we never can possibly describe anything but their behavior. We can say what they do, but we never can say what they are, and we can never say what does things. There isn't any need for anything that does anything. All you need is doing, that is energy. And that's enough for anybody. What is energy? Well, look at it and you can see for yourself. You don't need to define energy. Just like mathematicians found out that for purposes of geometry, you don't need to define a point. You use points, but you don't say what they are. To say that a point is that which has position but no magnitude is a lot of nonsense. Position but no magnitude. Uh, that's... <laughs> this is gobbledygook. And it's based on human beings con being confused by the words they use. So in this way then, uh, in Chinese thought, the world is process. And it's changes. Because behavior is change. And so they watch the rhythm of behavior. And as you see basically, one of the basic rhythms of behavior is a wave. Waves on the water waves of sound in the air, light waves. And the nature of a wave is that it's yang and yin. It has a crest and a trough. Now, you can't have a crest without a trough. You can't have half a wave. There is no such thing in nature as a half wave. So there are always full waves, at least one full wave in any energy system. And that implies... A now you see it, now you don't. An up and a down, a crest and a trough. And those, the crest is the yang, and the trough is the yin. Well, now the Book of Changes uh, has a very mysterious history. And scholars are naturally disposed to believe that a great deal of this history is pure legend. But there was supposed to have been, many thousand years ago, a great sage emperor by the name of Fu Shi, who was followed in due course by a king whose name was Wen. And Fu Shi is said to have looked around and studied nature, and to have felt the forces in it, and to have invented what are called the Bagua, or the Eight Trigrams. Now you see, if you will arrange yang and yin, which are represented by broken and unbroken lines. Unbroken line for yang, a broken line for yin. You, if you combine these in groupings of three, you have eight possible combinations. For example, three yang lines, which are unbroken, will then represent what the Chinese call chen, or heaven. Three broken lines, being all yang, all female, will therefore represent the opposite of heaven, which is earth. Two broken lines on either side of one unbroken line will represent water, and the opposite arrangement, two unbroken lines on either side of one broken one, will represent fire. And so on, until you get eight fundamental elements. And this, this is called the Bakwa, you will see on the national flag of Korea. There it is, with the Yang Yin symbol, the two um, interlocked black and white commas in the middle. And you will find this symbol of the Yang Yin and the Bakwa on ever so many plates 
and uh, Chinese objects, the backs of mirrors and things like that. It's a very common thing. And the idea is, you see, that it represents eight elements of the process of nature. Now, we used to say in the West, before in a pre-scientific age, that there were four elements, earth, water, fire, and air. We got this from India. The Indians add another one, actually, called Akash, which is space. Uh, We say now that is pre-scientific gobbledygook. Because actually, there are how many elements today? 90-something have been established by chemistry. But it's the same sort of thing as saying there are three primary colors, so many colors in the spectrum, so many notes in the scale. It is simply that in order to describe nature, you have to divide it up some way. For example, in classifying people, there are various schemes that have been worked out. We talk about there being extroverts and introverts, and Jung made up his four functions so that he could describe intuitive types, sensation types, thinking types, and feeling types. Sheldon uh, has his own special way where he can talk about ectomorphs, mesomorphs, and endomorphs, and then have them variously cerebrotonic, somatotonic, and viscerotonic. And he could combine these three in various ways. Now, a man like Aldous Huxley was quite obviously a cerebrotonic ectomorph, a long, skinny intellectual. (laughs) But if you look at any of these sort of classifications, you can always find flaws in them. They never really fit. And so in the same way, the, uh, say, political classifications that we have don't really fit people because their opinions are always too complicated unless they're quite stupid to be able to be fitted into any of these divisions in a precise way. But nevertheless, you can't do without classification of this sort. You can't do without spectra. Uh, We used to have a sergeant in training in in the army in England. We used to teach us about rifle shooting. And he said, Today we're going to practice aiming off for wind. Now there are three kinds of wind, mild, fresh, and strong. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, <laughs> three kinds of wind there you are, stuck with it <laughs> you see, because as always you can always think of this extreme that extreme and something in the middle See, well now you've got something a little richer to play with if you have eight instead of four and that's the, the sort of thing that the I Ching classification is based on. Now then, that was Fu Shi who was supposed to have invented these things. And there is another legend that he saw these trigrams by heating the shell of a tortoise until it cracked. And then studying the cracks. In the same way, Leonardo da Vinci used to go to a filthy old wall where there were all sorts of bird droppings and scratches and markings, and he would do a Rorschach blot on it, and he would see a great battle scene, and this would give him inspiration for a painting. Uh, This is the, the same thing that you do when you gaze in a crystal ball, or when you look into a deep pool of ink. Uh, There are all sorts of ways of what is called divining. To divine is um, to consult the oracle. Like, uh, it's like a, a word... To divine, you see there's a subject called divinity, which is to do with the scriptures. So to divine is to study the oracle, just as uh, Wittgenstein wanted to make a verb out of philosophy. Philosophy, he always thought to do philosophy. Philosophy isn't just a subject, it's an activity. And uh, so to divine is to call upon the unconscious. Instead of thinking something out in a logical way, you allow your imagination to flow into something that is useful for an oracle, whether it's a Rorschach blot or a crystal ball or a hexagram of the Book of Changes. For after Fu Shi, King Wen combined the eight trigrams and there are obviously 64 possible combinations of eight. And so the Book of Changes is simply a setting out of the 64 hexagrams with a commentary on them. 
And when you are a beginner in the art of the Book of Changes, you need the book. You look up the commentary to uh, help you find out what the hexagram means. But when you are an expert, you don't need the book. You simply feel the meaning of these combinations of uh, two elements. Now, the theory of the Book of Changes is a very curious one. And it's related to Gigi Muge. That is to say, the mutual interpenetration of all things and events. And is based on the idea that anything that happens at this moment will be related to this moment because it's in the context of this moment. Therefore, the way I would do something at random at this time will be what we call a sign of the times or a manifestation of what in German is called the Zeitgeist, the spirit of the time or the mind of the time. Uh, an another way of putting it would be the configuration of the time. And it's in the same way that, for example, astrologers cast what is called a horary horoscope. That is to say, as of the moment, what are the stars? What is, in other words, the configuration of the universe? And so, in exactly the same way, the Yi Jing philosophy is based on the idea that how one randomly selects the arrow stalks or the sticks or tosses coins in a given situation, and you might define the situation by asking a question, that random pattern that falls will be related to the situation and you can divine something about the situation from it. I remember a Zen master who used to use the I Ching. He had another way. He would take anything. He took, for example, one day a bowl of flowers and he looked at the pattern of the arrangement of the flowers and derived a hexagram from the, the pattern. And from that, he told us about the mood the person who had arranged them had been in. <laughs> now, of course, this is all, from our scientific point of view, unverified and may be unverifiable. And, of course, a scientific person poo-poos this kind of thing. Because you say, that's not the way to go about deciding what to do in an important situation. Or when you have to decide upon action in an important situation, what you do, if you're a scientifically minded person, is you study all the relevant data and you uh, get information. And then on the basis of that information and past experience and previous scientific studies of behavior, you decide how this situation is likely to turn out. But there is a very serious problem about that. It is not any use for practical purposes. <laughs> it is only applicable in trivial situations, which are highly controlled in an experimental way. For example, in the old times when you went to the doctor, he would look at you and prod you and smell you and uh, come up with some feeling about what was the matter with you. No doctor will do that today. They say, well, they don't move unless they take innumerable tests. See? So you're tested and measured precisely. Then they, they come back and they think about it. <clears throat> but you know, they still don't know what to do. <laughs> because there comes a point in any decision-making process where you have to act on hunch. How do you know when you've got in enough data about any situation? when to call a halt, because you can go on collecting data forever. There are always infinitely many variables in any situation whatsoever, and especially in the human situation. So ultimately, you don't kid yourself. You are always deciding on hunch what you're going to do. Even the best informed person ultimately comes to a leap of intuition before making a decision. So then, uh, when you really don't know which way to decide on a certain thing, people say, flip a coin. You know, you can always rib Christians on this because uh, um, the disciples of Jesus cast lots uh, and, uh, to make a decision. And, uh, but we're always doing that. You're, fundamentally, you're always at the point where you don't decide for what we call purely rational reasons.
So then, flipping a coin gives you two possibilities, yes or no. Now, let's suppose you had an eight-sided coin. See, six-sided dice is a little bit richer. Instead of giving you uh, uh, only two decisions, possibilities, here you've got a possibility of variation. Now let's consider a 64-sided coin. That's what you've got here. Uh, now, again, when you get the oracle in the Yijing, uh, it is never terribly specific. Although sometimes, in your given situation, it seems to be absolutely specific when you consult it. But on the other hand, uh, you, you use it like theologians use the Bible. That is to say, they read into it anything they want to find. Only, you mustn't do this deliberately. <laughs> you have to let your own unconscious processes uh, read the oracle for you and decide what it means. In other words, you use the oracle like a Rorschach plot. And the, the wisdom of that is this, that your brain, if it is your brain, and nobody really knows, you see, just to put something in parenthesis, is the brain the mind? Some say yes, some say no. One would think that the structure of the brain has something to do with the structure of thought. But on the other hand, it may not, in the same sense that a structure of a radio has nothing to do with the message that comes over it. Although Marshall McLuhan says, he belongs to the other school, you see, that the medium itself is the message. What is the relationship, for example, between the grid pattern of a newspaper photograph and the picture? The same grid pattern can convey any picture. So there seems to be a complete irrelevance between the two. But on the other hand, there is not quite as much irrelevance as you might think. Because any picture reproduced uh, by this method has some connection with a time and with a technology that can produce this method. It's a rather roundabout connection, that one. But nevertheless, from a big point of view, it's a very close connection. Depends where, what, uh, what uh, framework you're looking at it in. Whether you've got a very big framework or a very narrow one. But, so when it comes down to it, though, uh, and you don't know how to make a decision, all right, you, then you consult your brain. Now, I'm using the word brain here to mean a complex organization which you have at your disposal, which you don't understand, and which is much smarter than you are. Because you see, whatever it is that is the mind, the brain, or whatever, I don't care what you call it, it takes care of ever so many things at once which you could never possibly think of consciously. You can't be bothered consciously to regulate your glands, to see that your blood flows all right all the time, but your nervous system is taking care of that. It is regulating it all. Your nervous system is receiving information which you don't know anything about. Because when we look consciously, we by no means notice all that our eyes see. But your mind or brain registers everything that is input to your eyes. So genius in thinking is fundamentally based on being able to trust your own mind and not confuse your mind with the content of conscious perception. The content of conscious perception is a tiny fragment of what's going on around you. You can train yourself to be more receptive than you are in ordinary consciousness. But this isn't quite the point. It is not like, how many things did you notice? You know how you can play a game 
uh, with children and when they become boring in a car and uh, they get out a pad and write down how many things you noticed as you went along, you know? Scouts play this sort of thing. Well, that's all right, but that's not the point here. The point here is not how much did you notice. Because there's no end to that. You can play that game and there are infinitely many things that you could notice. The point is to take them all in in one glance. And you can't do that with conscious attention, but you do do it with your basic uh, neurological or mental equipment, whatever you want to call it. So therefore, you have at your disposal this amazing uh, computer, <laughs> or whatever it is, that can think um, multidimensionally, on ever so many levels at once. Now, thousands of years ago, we don't know how far all this goes back, but people naturally trusted their minds to tell them what to do. They didn't make decisions. They did what they felt like. Or as we should call it, they followed instinct, as animals do. Then they discovered how to figure through language and through numbers. <clears throat> they found that figuring could be very effective. And they started using it and relying on it more and more and more. And as a result of this developed anxiety. Because when you don't figure and you live purely spontaneously, you never worry. If this decision is disastrous, it's disastrous, and death will hit you in a hurry, and you'll never know what hit you. <laughs> you don't spend all your time worrying about, did you make up your mind in the right way? And you see, that may uh, lead to trouble. But the thing is that people don't realize is that everything leads to trouble in any case. <laughs> if you develop the intellect and its calculation processes to an excessive degree, what do you have? Well, you have the weapons lab of the United States Air Force, and you have the Russian uh, this, that, and the other, and the Chinese something else. Uh, <laughs> you have planned disaster. Uh, if you leave it alone, which is what the Taoists mean, partly by Wu Wei or non-interference, uh, uh, there will still be troubles in the world, but you won't have to worry about them. And you will float along, and you will feel very free. And the question is to try and con modern people into living that way. <laughs> now, uh, I'm putting this, you, you mustn't take me too literally. Because for a really well-developed human being, he isn't one who simply abandons thinking and planning. Because after all, that is some faculty that we have in just the same way that a bird has a beak. And you don't want to, as it were, um, amputate your faculties. The point is rather something like this. We have to recognize the hierarchical situation of our faculties. That the thinking faculty is the servant of the larger mind, which doesn't need to think. Just as God, uh, if I may use that expression again, uh, if you asked him, how high is Mont Blanc in millimeters? He would say, well, I really don't know. Uh, I'll have to measure it. <laughs> because to ask that question is to ask the relation of Mont Blanc to a ruler. 
Mont Blanc is not in itself any millimeters or meters in height. That is a, what is this is simply a short way of talking about comparing it with a scale. And knowing what it is in height is the same thing as comparing it with the scale. So the Lord would have to say, I must get out my ruler. Just in the same way as you don't know how you breathe, but you do it. So the Lord God creates the universe without knowing how it's done. That is to say, knowing in terms of technical considerations. But you still know how to breathe, even if you don't know how you do it, because you do it. That's knowing how to do it. You know how to walk. Do you know how to think? <laughs> Nobody does. But they do it. <coughs> so then, this unknown process produces the knowing process. But the knowing process is subordinate to it. And therefore you have to learn how to include thinking in spontaneity. But it's subordinate to spontaneity. That's when I wrote that thing in the bulletin about Suzuki and ended with a quotation in which he described his own life as a thinker because he was an intellectual, he was a scholar. But he did scholarship in the spirit of spontaneity. He used thinking. He was not used by thinking. And when I say he here, I'm referring to the mind beyond consciousness. Now, the mind beyond consciousness, we discussed a little bit of this yesterday, that we call um, the self, with a capital S, as distinct from the ego. And I pointed out why the horoscope was traditionally considered to be the map of the soul, and that the body is in the soul, not the soul in the body. So the mind that I am talking about is not merely your nervous system. If we will talk about it now in physical terms, it is not merely the nervous system, but it is the entire physical environment in which your nervous system exists and all the relationships operating within it. That's your mind. In other words, the kind of mind you have at this moment is impossible without your living in this kind of a society. Your mind includes the telephone book, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the University of California, uh, and everything else going on, say, in the intellectual world. Every one of us exists mentally in relation to the total intellectual process going on in this day and age in society. You draw on it, it infiltrates you, it provides you with language. You didn't invent the English language. It was given to you as a result of a social enterprise going on for thousands of years. So in this sense, uh, when you consult your mind, you are consulting the entire organization of the universe as it is immediately more immediately reflected in the structure of your nervous system and everything that your nervous system is doing, all the kinds of messages that are running through it. It is these messages that constitute the mind. And so, this is what Buckminster Fuller means when he talks about synergy. S-Y-N-E-R-G-Y. means the, from the Greek, synurgos, working together, and... Uh, um, he believes that any organization has more intelligence than any one of its members. And he therefore goes on to believe that the industrial complex of communication systems covering the face of the earth is developing its own intelligence. And it will be much more intelligent than any one of us. And this may perhaps save the situation. We don't know. 
I mean, one illustration of this is that I'm very familiar with is air transportation. Now, every country in the world has invested a fortune in jet aircraft. And by Jove, these things have to run, otherwise they fall apart. So they must run on time. And this network of air communications is joining every city in the world together so that by 1968, according to Buckminster Fuller, we have a one-town world. Figure it. If it takes you an hour to get from here to New York in a supersonic craft, New York is only as far away as Palo Alto. Well, that's practically in the same community. And this is going to include Tokyo and Moscow and uh, Paris and so on, and they're all going to become the same place. They'll speak increasingly the same language, share the same culture, eat the same food. If you can fly in San Francisco bread to Paris, which is being done, because some of the bread made here is better than the bread made in Paris. Um, you know, it can go the other way too. And uh, we're going to share a, a common urban culture. And this is the work of synergy. Also, the aircraft people get increasingly bored at passport and customs regulations because they hold up traffic. Well, now, then, uh, you might like to see how the I Ching is used. And uh, I have here, mainly for symbolic reasons, three ancient Chinese coins. You will see that they have a square hole in the middle and that on one side they're inscribed and on the other side they're not. And the inscribed side is counted as the yin face and the uninscribed side is counted as the yang. And when you use the Book of Changes, you um, usually face it with a question. And uh, it seems to me that a good question that it might be faced with is what should the people of the United States do about China? And you um, uh, respectfully request <laughs> the wisdom of the oracle in this matter. And um, you throw the coins down to see how they fall. And what I have is one yang and two yins. Now, strangely enough, that counts in the system, and I don't quite know why, as... Uh, what's called the yang, yang. I think maybe I do know why. You would think it would be a yin, with two yins and one yang, but it counts as the yang, yang, and uh, that's the bottom line of the hexagram. And by being a yang, yang, it means it's a fixed line. It doesn't change. Perhaps the reason why that's called the, the uh, yang yang is that when you've got two yins and one yang, it means the yin is weakening and the yang is coming up. Because when you reach a point at which the yin force comes to a maximum, there is in it the seed of the yang force and vice versa. And you see, you have to do this six times to get six lines. And so this time we have two yangs and one yin, which gives us the yang yin. And that again is a line which doesn't change. And we get two yins and one yang, which gives us another yang 
Yang, and has made the hexagram of water. No, fire. And this time we get three yin, which gives us a changing yin line, which is written like this. That means that after you consult the hexagram in its first form, you consult the hexagram which is, so far as that line is concerned, the opposite. Again, two yins and one yang, giving us the yang yang. And we get here two yangs and one yin. Gives us the yang yin. And so we get fire over water. Water over fire. Water over fire. Cool it, baby. <laughs> so that is five over. Sway, sway, sway. See, the oracle is often very surprising. 63. GG, meaning after completion. This hexagram is the evolution of Tai, or uh, the hexagram number 11, meaning peace. The transition from confusion to order is completed and everything is in its proper place, even in particulars. The strong lines are in the strong places, the weak lines in the weak places. This is a very favorable outlook, yet it gives reason for thought. <laughs> for it is just when perfect equilibrium has been reached that any movement may cause order to revert to disorder. The one strong line that has moved to the top thus affecting complete order in details, is followed by the other lines, each moving according to its nature. And thus suddenly there arises again the hexagram P, number 12, which is standstill. Let's see, we're going to move to... forty-seven. No. Now, here comes uh, the, the oracle itself. It says, after completion, which is the name of the hexagram. Success in small matters. Perseverance furthers. At the beginning, good fortune. At the end, disorder. Then following the judgment comes another part of the oracle called the image. Water over fire. The image of the condition in after completion. Thus the superior man takes thought of misfortune and arms himself against it in advance. And then there's a comment on the lines. And we have a, an eight in the... So, no, a six in the one fourth place. 
And the oracle here says of this line, which is a moving one, the finest clothes turn to rags. Be careful all day long. Now, uh, there are many comments on this. But we should look first at the hexagram it turns into, which is uh, number, what did I say, 43, I think I said. Yeah. 47. Turns into 47. Well, the one it turns into uh, indicates the direction of the motion of the... It turns into kun, which means oppression or exhaustion, with the lake above and the water below. The judgment is oppression, success, perseverance. The great man brings about good fortune, no blame. When one has something to say, it is not believed. The image. There is no water in the lake. The image of exhaustion. Thus the superior man stakes his life on following his will. There is a comment on this one. It says, the lake is above, water below. The lake is empty, dried up. In other words, the water flows out. Exhaustion is expressed in yet another way. At the top, a dark line is holding down two light lines. Below, a light line is hemmed in between two dark lines. The upper trigram belongs to the principle of darkness, the lower to the principle of light. Thus, everywhere, superior men are oppressed and held in restraint by inferior men. <clears throat> now the commentary on the judgment of the original hexagram reads the transition from the old to the new time is already accomplished in principle everything stands systematized and it is only in regard to details that success is still to be achieved. In respect to this, however, we must be careful to maintain the right attitude. Everything proceeds as if of its own accord, and this can all too easily tempt us to relax and let things take their own course without troubling over details. Such indifference is the root of all evil. Symptoms of decay are bound to be the result. Here we have the rule indicating the usual course of history, but this rule is not an inescapable law. He who understands it is in position to avoid its effects by dint of unremitting perseverance and caution. And then the image, which is water over fire. When water in a kettle hangs over fire, the two elements stand in relation and thus generate energy. But the resulting tension demands caution. If the water boils over, the fire is extinguished and its energy is lost. If the heat is too great, the water evaporates into the air. These elements here brought into relation and thus generating energy are by nature hostile to each other. Only the most extreme caution can prevent damage. In life, there are junctures when all forces are 